inflation has turned, but there is evidence that it is sticky. We're now transitioning to this environment where central banks are divided over how do you wrestle with inflation rates. For the ECB, for the Fed, it's all about real rates. Central banks have kept interest rates too low for too long. In some respects, um, you know, I think the Fed's been dealt a better hand than the ECB. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Do you remember that soft CPI print? No, like 10 I years don't. ago. <laughs> exactly. Maybe, but it doesn't seem to be playing out right now. Live from New York City this morning. Good morning, good morning. That feels like a lifetime ago. Equity futures right now down 1.3% on the S&P, adding to the losses of yesterday. What did President Lagarde say that had an effect on this market the Chairman Powell didn't say and couldn't shape this market. We're not going to pivot again. How many times do I have to say this? What language do I have to speak? We're going to go and we're going to go hard. Also, the projections changed. They upgraded their forecast for inflation and they had a uniformly hawkish uh, expectation for what they're going to do. And rates are moving big time in Germany, in Italy, in Italy the last couple of days. So Thursday up 30 basis points this morning, up another 21. How quickly does this start to become a problem for this ECB? I am going to wonder what, what's going to happen with that. At the same time, you had better than expected PMI data that came out of uh, Europe over the past 24 hours. So they're kind of leaning on a bit of strength and a bit of a reprieve from the natural gas prices that they have. To your point, this is the reason why people don't believe some of the hawkish speak in the U.S. At what point will they start pushing back with that lack of credibility uh, in the Eurozone? The Fed speaks back today. You excited? Coming up a little bit later. You this are. <laughs> we've got a we've got a host of Fed speak. I am wondering if they push back against the market a little bit more. If they say we'll see. what Bill Dudley said, which is the more that the market doesn't believe us, the harder we have to go, the more we have to punish you, which is essentially uh, what some of the rhetoric had been earlier in the year. The former Fed officials are super hawkish. Super, super, super hawkish. They sound more like President Lagarde than the current Fed officials. Looking forward to catching up with Mr. Williams a little bit later. Bramo will give you the time of that in just a moment. I want to go through the price action for you on the SP. We are are lower by 1.4 percent. I've talked a lot about the bond market in Europe. We'll continue to do so. But on a 10-year in America, up another four or five basis points. On the 10-year, 349.32. Euro dollar just seems to be stuck between a rock and a hard place. Is this positive, the currency, or is it negative for the currency that this ECB is determined to hike interest rates, Bramo, into a recession? 106.21. This has been the dilemma all year. Traditionally, the more hawkish a central bank has been, the more you start to see strength in that currency. And this year has turned it on its head because weakness has meant a weaker currency. And people are trying to struggle with that. And you're seeing that with a lack of direction, really, in the euro dollar cross. Right now, what I'm looking at is Fed speak. We do get a host of it. I know it's incredibly excited. New York Fed President John Williams joining at 8.30 a.m. alongside Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes. Later in the day, we get San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly. That's at noon. And then with our own Michael McKee, Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 3.30 p.m. How much do they push back against some of the optimism, the hopium, as some people would say, in equity markets? At 9.45 a.m., we get the S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMI for the month of December. Do we get a sixth consecutive withdrawal or, or downturn in some of the basic manufacturing and services sectors in the U.S. Does that give you a sense, perhaps, of that soft landing? How do people interpret it? Do people even care at this point? Have people just left for the The data's been really mixed. I've, I've got to say, if you look at the data that came out yesterday, retail sales, was that the worst in 11 months? Dropped the most in 11 months. You looked at industrial production. Factory production declined for the first time since June. And then jobless claims just kind of ripped up the script. 211. Close to 200,000. I think that's really confusing for a lot of people. Which is the reason why a lot of people aren't going to look at any of it and just watch the World Cup on Sunday at 10 a.m. Uh, or there Argentina and France face off, and they're going to basically cash it in for the year. And, and for TK as well. He's away today. He's going to come back on Monday. He's got France as his winning team, and his bracket is absolutely dominating. How do you I think feel he's. About that? I think he's placed 30 in the whole of Bloomberg in the firm out of thousands. You gave How do him 30, I feel about you, you that? You gave him, I think, 20 seconds to talk about that yesterday. You were like, all right, here's your victory lap. Go. I said, okay, congratulations. Go. I mean, the issue is, <laughs> and I'm terrible at this, and I said this ahead of time, he chose his teams based on the colours of their jerseys. <laughs> and he likes blue, so he went France-Argentina, but he likes France blue that little bit more, and he's going with France. That was the logic that went into this. Which... Really bothers you because then, you gave a lot of thought to okay, it and got it wrong. It's a tiebreaker, just <laughs> so everyone really understands. Honest. It's a tiebreaker in the World Cup bracket here at Bloomberg on the terminal. You have to choose how many goals are scored in the tournament. Okay, so I went with about 160. Do you know what Tom went with? Four. That's how much Tom knows 
about football. Okay, that's no his tiebreaker. coming from a complete Four. place of knowledge. I do think it's going to be interesting, though, to see Mbappe versus Messi. And I will say that the one thing that's been the takeaway is Messi has won out over Ronaldo in terms of oh, big time. the best player and the one who's going to be most respected going down. Big time. Let's see how things take shape on Sunday. This is how things have taken shape this week. President Lagarde with maybe her most hawkish address I've ever seen. Anybody who thinks that this is a pivot for the ECB is wrong. We're not pivoting. We're not wavering. We have more ground to cover. You have lo we have longer to go. This is not a pivot. We're not slowing down. We're in for the long game. Let's go through that language. We're not pivoting. We're not wavering. We have more ground to cover. We have longer to go. Lisa, we're in it for the long game. That was pretty blunt yesterday, wasn't it? And then Bloomberg came out with a story saying that a couple of members wanted a 75 basis point rate hike and that that was a serious contention. So sort of adding to this feeling, there still is a lot of feeling that they need to curtail this inflation. Let's get to Steve Chavarone. He joins us now. They had a multi-asset solutions at Federated Hermes. Steve, I'd love your view on what we've heard from the Federal Reserve, the Bank of England, the ECB this week. Well, I mean, it was refreshing to hear a very clear, uh, concise view from President Lagarde. I think sometimes uh, in the U.S. we start off there and we go a sentence too long and we provide some confusing, wavering advice. But I, look, I mean, regardless of the Fed speak or, or sometimes the communication mishaps, the story of 2022 has been one of a Fed that has consistently moved in a hawkish direction and continues to do so. And I think if you look at what's going on in the labor market, you, you can really understand why. And so I think, you know, look, we've got 75 basis points worth of hikes left in the dot plots. I think you're likely going to see that. And I think you fight the Fed on this at your peril. Which is the reason why a lot of people are wondering why so many people are fighting the Fed. In fact, the consensus is fighting the Fed. I'm looking right now at the terminal rate mm -hmm. that people are looking at for the end of next year. It's 4.4%. The Fed is saying it will be 5.1%. How does that really squeeze out risk appetite? What has to give in markets as people get back to either the Fed's point of view or as the Fed drops it to the market's view? Yeah, look, I think the market has misinterpreted a couple of things. We have seen a drop in the CPI data over the course of the last couple of months. That's encouraging. But if you look at where it's come from, it's primarily come from goods. It's primarily come from flexible priced items. What you're not seeing at this point, and, I, and the Fed, I think, is starting to call this out more acutely, what you're not seeing it, it occur in is the service prices, and in particular, sticky price goods and wage inflation. You are simply not going to get to a consistent 2% inflation rate if you're running wage growth between 5 and 6%. And the only way to fix that is to get the labor market back into equilibrium. I think the reason that the Fed hasn't been as clear as maybe some of the market would like is because that's very delicate politically to say, look, we need the unemployment rate to go above 6%. Um, but ultimately, I think that's where it needs to go, and I think that's where they're pushing. So you can see good prices fall. That's not going to dissuade the Fed. What they said very clear uh, this week was they need to get the, the labor market back to equilibrium, and they're simply not there yet. Otherwise, they risk a reaccelerating inflation a la the 70s. Well, Steve, this and speaks I don't think to the something grasped that yet. we heard from Michael Harlow of Bank of America this morning. It's OK. I just want to share this quote with you. Central banks tightening into a mid-23 hard landing. That's what he's talking about. And echoing what you just said, we've had 400 basis points of Fed tightening in nine months. We're going to get another 75 potentially in the next five to six months. Throws in the ECB, 250 basis points in six months, likely to get 125 more expected over the next nine months. And he said this, and Steve, I wonder if you share this view. Quicker labour markets break, the quicker the end to the bear market. Steve, do you share that last line? Do you share that view? I do. I just don't know if it's going to play out that way. Um, you know, the recession here is the bull case. Uh, if you get a recession, if it has some depth, if you wring out inflation, then I think you're on the other side of it. You can get back to some monetary stimulus and you're right back where you were pre-pandemic. I think what's emerging, though, and the thing that has us concerned is 2023 could end up being a kind of widow maker in terms of a market where you've got two consensus views out there, John. One is the soft landing crowd. The other one is a kind of early, shallow recession. Um, you see a lot of this in the strategist community, kind of a first quarter recession. You're well on your way to recovery by the back half. We're starting to think that you know the, the, the trade that causes the most pain to the most people, and therefore it might be most likely, is a later recession that happens to be deeper, that it takes longer for those labor markets to break, um, that the Fed has to go further to wring out the inflation, 
And so you could have a scenario where the soft landing folks are breaking their arms, patting themselves on the back, and the early recession folks are capitulating, you know, right as you get a second half kind of meaningful slowdown. Uh, that's going to be a very difficult environment to to navigate because it means you could have a first half rally. So I, we just think that the the you know the word of the day for next year is humility. Uh, if you've been wrong on on inflation for two years and wrong on rates for a year, you know don't think that you're going to be able to call the path next year yeah. with certainty. Yes, it's going to slow, but who knows when? And I think it could be later than people think. Just quickly then, Steve, as you basically pack up your bags and get ready to check out for the rest of the year, what are your final sort of portfolio arrangements that you're doing to prepare for that turmoil, that humility? Yeah, yeah. well, it, it, it's, it's a closer to neutral portfolio. You know, we're just very slightly underweight equities, but we are underweight. We have a, a preference for dividend paying defensive stocks, which I think do well in a market that slows. We're in cash. Uh, you know, you, we want a length and duration. Everyone wants a length and duration, but it's not as compelling at 3.4% as it would be at 4 So, you know, we're going to be patient in lengthening that duration. We're underweight credit. We're probably not as underweight cyclical stocks as we would like to be heading into a recession, just so that if we have a kind of first half rally, we, we have some ability to participate. That's how we're positioned, and we'll see how things break. Hey, Steve, looking forward to catching up with you through the new year. Thank you for everything you've done for us this year. We appreciate it, Steve. It's good to catch up, buddy, as always. Steve Chevron there of Federated Hermes. Do you know what I'm really confused by in central bank news conferences at the moment? On the one hand, they say no forward guidance, and on the other, they offer you forward guidance. President Lagarde yesterday, meeting by meeting, but ultimately indicating that we're going to go 50 for the next couple of meetings. What is that about? Okay, basically, they're not going to tell you what they're going to do, but they're going to tell you... What they're going to do. What they're going to do. <laughs> <laughs> well, they can't. The problem is, is that when you have markets that are forward discounting mechanisms, how do you not provide forward guidance if you want to use financial conditions as your tool to affect monetary policy? I mean, it, it makes your head spin. Hey, there's no forward guidance, but there's no cuts next year, okay? I'm just very just, humble. Just make sure you price that in. Very humble. Emily Rowland is John Hancock Investment Management in the next hour. And that softer CPI print, I tell you, it feels like a lifetime ago. This equity market is lower again this morning. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia has launched another large scale missile st attack on Ukraine. Several cities have been hit, including the capital Kyiv. Widespread power outages have been reported. The attack comes a day after a top Ukrainian army commander warned there's no doubt Russian forces will try to seize Kyiv as soon as next month. A Russian assault in the spring failed. In Beijing, a rapidly spreading COVID outbreak has turned the Chinese capital into a virtual ghost town. That underscores the cost of President Xi Jinping's sudden pivot away from COVID zero. Anecdotal evidence suggests entire families and offices in Beijing have become infected in the span of just days. That could be the preview of what the rest of China faces. The Senate has averted a possible shutdown of the U.S. government. Thursday night, it passed a one-week funding bill needed to keep the government in business past Saturday. That gives negotiators more time to hash out agreements on funding levels for federal agencies for the current fiscal year. Twitter has suspended the accounts of several prominent journalists covering the company's billionaire owner, Elon Musk. Musk says they were endangering his family by posting his real-time location. The journalists deny that. Those suspended include reporters from The Washington Post, New York Times, and CNN. And Boeing is closing in on an order for as many as 200 of its own 737 MAX jets from Air India's new owner, Tata Group. Bloomberg's learned the two sides are trying to wrap up talks before the holidays. Tata is working on rebuilding the formerly state-run airline. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. We need to be prudent in terms of costs. Entering into 2023 in particular, even postponing uh, to just wait and see how the environment is turning. But I think we need to also carry on investing. A SoftGen CEO as Europe faces tougher times. Mike Mayo coming out yesterday of Wells Fargo. This is what he had to say about the financials in the United States. Mm. 
Banks should perform better in an upcoming recession than for any other in modern history. Leishree went on to say banks have prepared for this moment for over a decade. Now, are we talking about relative terms or absolute terms? Absolute terms, just the amount of cash that they have on their balance sheets. The fact that you have really highly capitalized banks that have been arguing that they are too safe and that they have not been able to invest in risk, and suddenly risk is toxic again, and now they have the ability to keep lending and to survive. And so this is why he sees them rising 50%. Well, that's my point. If someone said that, typically I'd be thinking, OK, so you're looking for relative outperformance to the index or to another sector, but you're looking for absolute returns 50% of that group next year going into a recession in America. The idea here is that they've been so beaten up for okay. so long and they've been so undervalued and that suddenly people will view them as more of a play on a new cycle. Again, you can argue, Mike Mayo always has fabulously uh, controversial calls. And props. And, what? And props. Yeah, what, what prop would it be for this? I've got no idea. A toaster? Unicorn. That you can get? Next time you 50 up, move. Yeah. If we get a 50 percent move, fair play to him. He knows more about banks than I do. There's your prop. He's saying it's showtime, showtime for the financials. We'll pick up on that a little bit later on the equity side of things. Let's head over to Europe with Maria Tadeo in Brussels and head down to DC with AMH. Maria, can you help us all understand where the Europeans are on this energy effort when it comes to capping prices? Uh, well, uh, you are confused. I've been confused. Our viewers probably have been confused because this is a conversation that's been going on for months now. But just to reset and take everyone back, for weeks, the Europeans have said the TTF, remember, that is the main ben benchmark for gas prices, no longer reflects the nature of the European energy market, which has moved away from Russian gas. So they want to put a cap on the maximum price that you can pay on that. The initial proposal by the European Commission was to cap it at 270 euros megawatt hour. That was not agreed. And yesterday night, European leaders, the vast majority of them, agreed that there should be a cap, but change the price range. The range is now between 160 euros to 220 euros megawatt hour. What's changed here is that there is now a majority to get this price cap going. In fact, they have a deadline. They told European ministers, come Monday, you need to get this deal done. It yeah. cannot drag into 2023. The question is, how do you settle? What's the price point? And at this point, we don't know. And Maria, probably the reason why people are struggling with this is because suddenly you're not making this, you're making this a, a closed market. You're not, it's not a market at all. And Maria, today, oh, I am wondering from your perspective whether the disagreement comes from who profits from the supply demand dynamics that underpin normal economics. Do you have to finance the energy companies, the natural gas producers, or do you basically tell them this is going to be on you? Keep producing, but we're not going to pay you. The fundamental disagreement, and maybe I'm guilty of this too, is that when we talk about the European energy market, the reality is there isn't one. You have 27 countries that have different systems that have a completely uh, different energy mix. Uh, some that worry about supply, others are worrying more about price, some that have the fiscal capacity, others that do not have the fiscal capacity. By the way, the Italians are fuming after that decision yesterday from the European Central Bank and the message from the Italian Prime Minister yesterday is that there needs to be a European solution that brings down energy prices so you can see the tension building but the fundamental issue is that we talk about a very complex global market but at the same time there isn't a unified European energy market this needs to bring in 27 different countries that do not share the same vision and that is fundamentally always a reason why conversations like this drag on for weeks months but ultimately usually end with a deal Anne Marie, is anyone talking in Washington, D.C., uh, ongoing about possibly curtailing exports to Europe of natural gas? There was some discussion about that when prices were surging here in the U.S., then they fell off. Now they're rising again in the face of colder yeah. weather. What's the talk in D.C.? Well, there's always this potential that the U.S. could do that right to make sure that they're shoring up their own supplies for U.S. consumers. But the issue is, is that when you look at the market dynamics, what that would do is just increase the prices overall in the global market, and that's where everything is traded, so it could potentially backfire. And I think at the moment what you have is that potentially this is something that people do bring up, but it would really be 
a huge move and the United States is just nowhere near that yet. It also would not look great for the administration that's really trying to make sure that they are holding this alliance firm, especially as we go into the winter months. And what you see uh, Vladimir Putin doing, what you see him doing today, is another day of barrage of missiles, and this is on key Ukrainian infrastructure. So really trying to starve the Ukrainian people of power, of water, electricity, gas, so they can heat their homes. Um, so at the moment, I just, don't, I just don't think there's an appetite for that. MH, on that war, a few days ago, we were waiting to see if we get a decision on new okay. defence, new defence sent to the Ukrainians from the United States. Where are we on that decision? Well, we do have huge bipartisan support with the passing of the defence um, spending bill last night in the Senate, and that will send money not just to Ukraine, but also Taiwan. I mean, $858 billion, and then, of course, the next week is going to be all about the stopgap funding uh, so the government can continue operating and they avoid a shutdown. When it comes to the Patriot missiles, we are still waiting on an announcement from the U.S. government. And the reporting has been that President Biden has yet to sign off on this, but that they are moving to send those Patriot missiles to Ukraine. But we went through this. There's a lot of questions about them. Will they be the newest grade or there be a little bit of the older versions? Where will individuals get trained on them? Um, but this is something that President Zelensky has really been pushing for, especially now when yesterday you had a top Ukrainian official talking about the fact that they think Putin can make a play for Kiev in January and potentially do that via Belarus. He's moved thousands of troops into Belarus. And on Monday, Putin will be visiting Lukashenko in Minsk. Amri, just quickly, we know why the Ukrainians want that missile defence system. Can you tell us why the US is reluctant to provide it, why they're hesitant about doing so? Well, there's been a lot of hesitation with some weaponry going over to Ukraine because already even the talk of Patriot missiles, what you heard from the Russian foreign ministry, is that they view this as an escalation of the war and they view this as the United States basically joining. What the U.S. has always wanted to do was contain this and didn't want to escalate it further. MH, Maria Tadeo, to the two of you. Maria, don't worry. We'll get your thoughts on the World Cup in about 60 minutes from now on TV and radio. Yeah. Done. Is, that, is that it? Is that the decision? Is that what, who you're going Obviously. for? It is everything from me. Will, everything will be revealed. No, no, no. Everything will be revealed in due course. We don't do it like this in surveillance. Everything will be okay. revealed with good arguments. That's, that's the tease. But she's speaking in French. <laughs> I thought she'd given it away <laughs> Yeah, there. exactly. You're going to speak in French, but it's not clear who she's going uh, to support. On surveillance, there must be good mm -hmm. arguments, but then didn't provide anyway. MH, Maria, coming up in 60 minutes again. I want to draw your attention to this story. Uh, forgive me if I'm pronouncing the name of this firm wrong, but French auditing firm Mazars Group has paused work for all crypto clients globally, according to crypto exchange Binance, which was a customer of said auditing firm. That firm, quote, has indicated that they will temporarily pause their work with all of their crypto clients globally, which include Crypto.com, KuCoin and Binance. At least it goes on to say, unfortunately, this means that we will not be able to work with Mazars for the moment. That's according to a spokesperson for Binance in an emailed statement to Bloomberg News a little bit earlier today. I don't want to extrapolate and no perjure. need to. Um, however, there is a sense of concern that's growing of how do some of the big crypto clients, how do they really deal with a lack of clarity around things like proof of reserves, around things like their streams of finance, some of the things that really hit FTX hard. And those that did have auditing firms could rely on their credibility. If you have one of those major finance firms, auditing firms, pull away, what does that do in terms of potential consequences going forward? The Binance spokesperson went on to say, we embrace additional transparency and we are looking into how best to provide those details in the coming months. If we get additional detail, we'll share it with you. Coming up, Callum Pickering, the senior economist at Berenberg, on a massive week for central banks. 50 basis point hike from the Federal Reserve, 50 from the Bank of England and 50 from the ECB. And an ECB that says we're going to do a whole lot more. Live from New York, this is Bloomberg. Closing out the week on a bit of a low on the S&P right now. We are lower by about 1% on the S&P 500. Futures negative on the Nasdaq by 7 tenths of 1%. Adding to the losses 
of the last couple of days, Wednesday, Thursday. In a bond market, twos, tens and thirties on Treasury shaping up as follows. Your two-year actually hasn't done a whole lot over the last few days. It's still in and around 425 on a two-year in America. On a 10-year, bleeding just a little bit higher by, let's call it five basis points to 349.50. If you want to see a move, look to Europe. Wow, wow, wow. Yesterday, we had a monster move in Italy by 30 basis points and we're up. Another 20 on a 10-year to 437. Lisa in Germany, the 10-year there, up 10 or 11 basis points to 219. And Sock Gen, send us more to come. Two-year yields in Germany were up more than 20 basis points Flying. just yesterday. That is the biggest one-day move going back to 2008, that according to Deutsche Bank's Jim Reed. How much further can they go before something breaks? You pointed this out, and I keep going back to that. We were talking about the impossibility of this central bank ever moving above zero. And here we are, going further and further, and nothing has broken, and people are thinking, well, maybe we can even have a soft landing. Is that possible? I won't say things have broken, but are things breaking when you look at Italy? BTPs at 430, is that a problem? 450? Is it a problem at 5, 550? When does that start to become a problem? We will find out when it becomes a liquidity issue as well, because right now it hasn't necessarily become the same kind of liquidity issue, causing people to not be able to raise money because people don't have to yet. And QT hasn't started yet either. That's going to start early next year. What did you make of what we heard on QT? On the rates thing, I think on rates, without a doubt, hawkish. Pushing back against the terminal rate. If you were thinking that was the last 50 basis point hike from this central bank, they're going to go again. They might go again. They might go again after that. On QT, was that QT light from this ECB going into next year? just going to say that. I mean, it's pretty minimal, the amount that they're rolling off every single month, number one. And number two, there still is that emergency uh, purchasing program from the pandemic that will continue to make reinvestments through 2024, giving them a little more leeway, potentially, to offset some of the pressures that you're seeing in the periphery. Yields in Germany and Italy absolutely flying. ECB President Christine Lagarde sending a warning to markets. It's time to adjust. More needs to be done, and as a result, new market expectations will hopefully be embedded in future staff projections, which will indicate that we can reach the 2% inflation target timely. More work needs to be done. Callum Pickering joining us now, the senior economist at Berenberg. Callum, have you ever seen President Lagarde as hawkish as she was yesterday? No, that actually took us a little by surprise at just how hawkish she was, especially given the fact that we can see evidence that the Eurozone economy is in recession, that there's probably not a major demand side element to this inflation. We don't see any weird stuff going on in wages, for instance, like we might in the US or the UK. Uh, the danger here is that central banks start to go a little bit too far. Uh, monetary policy works with a lag. All the major central banks reacted too late to inflation. Now they may be repeating the opposite mistake as, well, reacting too late to the signs of disinflation. Callum, do you think that something could break given the pace of some of these recent moves? I mean, it, it depends how you define break. In, in, in one respect, central banks want stuff to break because that's the thing that gives you the recession that brings out the inflation. Um, we like to think that central banks can fine-tune, but they really can't. They're powerful institutions, but they're clumsy. A soft landing, in my view, is a recession that doesn't entail a major drop in GDP, such as, say, 4 or 5%, or a major rise in the unemployment rate. I think what we're going to get from the Eurozone economy and the, the UK, probably the US eventually as well, is you know, one to three percentage point drops in GDP, depending on the economy, a bit of a rise in unemployment. Uh, but that's based on the fact that central banks don't go much further than they already have. But of course, if you keep going, you find tolerance levels for everything. Eventually, stuff starts to crack. You simply can't price loans once interest rates rise to a certain level. Callum, I was surprised at some of the projections that we saw, not only from the ECB, but also the Federal Reserve, increasing their expectations for year-end inflation next year and in 2024. The ECB's uh, expectation rising more than I had previously thought, and even more than what the Fed upgraded theirs to see. What are they seeing that's sticky if it's not wages, if it's not demand side, the way you're saying? It could just be that we've had a structural break, and I think this is probably the reason, in the way that central banks view inflation. Uh, we've had for 
certainly 12 years after the financial crisis, but actually even in the early 2000s, central banks were thinking about this zero lower bound problem, where in a disinflationary environment, you get stuck at the zero lower bound and central banks struggle to stimulate. In that kind of world, you would be prone to react strongly to downside risks, especially if they're disinflationary, but just take your time in reacting to any upside inflation risks. Now we're in a world, and increasingly you hear uh, economists discussing aging populations, deglobalization, the fact that fiscal policy is more activist again, is pushing inflation rates higher in the long run. In that kind of scenario, you say, well, we should overreact to signs of inflation, but then underreact to signs of disinflation. And so what we might be observing here is just that first shift that comes with that structural change in the infl inflation environment. Callum, I want to talk about the threat of recession into next year. I think a lot of our audience have heard the same thing over the last three months or so, looking ahead to 2023. If we get a recession, don't worry about it. It will be short. It will be shallow. That's both on the depth and the duration. No big concern. We heard that again in the ECB statement yesterday, and I'll show you the line that reads as follows. According to the latest Eurosystem staff projections, a recession would be relatively short-lived and shallow. Callum, given their projections, given the pushback of this ECB president on terminal rates pricing and given where this economy already is, how on earth can we keep sitting here and saying it's going to be short-lived? Uh, first, I actually still think the ECB's projections are a bit too optimistic. On the whole, I think the Feds are too. The Bank of England starts to sound a bit realistic near term, but it's probably too pessimistic next year. The reason why you would, as your base case, assume that this is going to be a short-lived recession is simply because actually we're not ready for a recession across the Western world. We had two years of recovery from COVID, but during those two years, we barely got back to our pre-COVID levels of GDP. We didn't significantly over leverage on the household or the corporate side. Banks capital is still high. We don't have piles of excess capital investment or even excess inventory in major parts of the economy hanging around. We didn't have a big housing bubble where we built too much across Europe and the US. And so when you don't have those signs, typically the recession that comes due to an exogenous shock, and that's what we have, we have a global energy supply shock, typically lasts as long as the shock lasts. Um, and then once the shock fades, economies recover. That's very different from the other kind that I mentioned, the business cycle downturn, where you need to go through this cleansing uh, phase. Uh, the, the, the problem here is if we tighten financial conditions too much into this exogenous shock, what we're doing is putting economies under additional pressure. And I think that's where the downside risk starts to come. My bet is that Bank of England probably gets another 25 basis points. That's it. Peak rate in the eurozone is probably around three and a half. Fed gets to say five and a quarter. That still airs on the safe side, in my view. If we go beyond that, then I think we start to worry about things a little bit more in terms of the, the profile of the recession. Just to take this a little bit further, everything you said, I think, goes into the calculation about how deep this recession yep. might be. And I hear you, without the excess, I think a lot of people come into the conclusion it will be shallow. But I'm talking about the duration of the downturn, Callum. You've got central banks telling you that they want to take demand down and that they want to yep. keep that terminal rate there for longer. I think what I'm trying to work out, Callum, is yes, on the depth side of things, I understand there's a really strong consensus over the shallow. But on the short-lived bit of piece of this, Callum, isn't there a real risk here that we have below-trend growth for, for quite a period of time once this starts to kick in? A below trend growth or a slow recovery from a shallow recession is possible. What I don't think we need to worry too much about is this kind of L-shaped shock that we are often warned about. Um, what I notice is economist models lack one thing, and mine included, of course, imagination. We always have a backward-looking approach to forecasting the future, which means when we're missing a key element from our historical model, in this case, let's say you have 5% less energy in the world because you have the supply-related issues due to the, the Russian invasion of Ukraine, you say, well, how can our economy ever be 5% be uh, uh, bigger? Or, excuse me, how can we not reverse this 5% drop? Well, what we don't factor in our models is the fact that we become more energy efficient, that we, uh, through the price mechanism, react to the price signals and profit signals, and in the end, we adapt. Uh, we have 100 years of economic history of re reacting to shocks. The price mechanism works things out, and then the economy rebounds. Just look at how quickly we recovered from COVID. And so my bet would be that 
it's animal spirits, it's our bearishness that makes us think about the world in this context. But actually, once we start to see the, uh, the movement towards a recovery, probably by summer next year in Europe, late next year in the US, we start to feel optimistic and we can easily imagine a world in which we get something stronger during the recovery phase. Hey, Callum, this was thoughtful stuff. I appreciate it, sir. As always, Callum Pickering there of Berenberg. Looking ahead to 23 and that consensus that if we get a downturn here, Bramo, it will be short and shallow. Yeah, and a lot of people pushing back. And I have to be honest, I was speaking with Howard Marks yesterday of Oak Tree. How did that go? Talking about, it was fascinating. He's saying that he's lived through three sea changes in the investment world during his career. And right now, we're in the third. And we're heading into a new era of probably higher interest rates. And where suddenly you're not going to have that tailwind of falling interest rates. And what are the consequences of that? And it does speak to potentially, and this is my extrapolation, a lot more pain out there, a very different risk reward calculus. And, you know, how to even understand what's going to happen is to understand where we are. And people cannot agree even on that. I mean, for example, is the China reopening inflationary or deflationary? Uh, you tell me. I mean, Bridgewater came out and said it's inflationary. And that actually is the worst case scenario for the U.S. and Europe because it will actually increase demand for some of the commodities out there, jack up inflation just as Europe slows down. I mean, again, you get five people in a room, five different opinions. Isn't that a waste of way? I feel like it's more like that recently. I feel like the bifurcation between the different views is dramatic. And I do feel like there still is a faith we're heading back to a low rate, low inflation regime. Oh, the pre-pandemic playbook. It's just how we get there. Without a doubt. I don't see any evidence on the economic side that we're really heading back to that so quickly. When you have 10 years of conditioning, it takes a while to shake it off. That was the pushback from Savita Subramaniam over at Bank of America. People just want to gravitate back towards tech and the stuff that used to work and rewarded them so well for 10 years. And Lisa, she's asking whether it will going into 23. And at what point do people capitulate to that view? You were hearing that from Steve, right? If there is sort of some sort of slowdown in growth, do people think, okay, this is it. Go in and then get slammed with a downturn. The discipline of 5% interest rates. No no baseball caps and hoodies. I was about to say, suits and ties, heading back to the office. Suits and ties back in the bank. You know. Unless you're at Citigroup and you get to take the rest of the year off. I saw that. You can work anywhere at City for the next two weeks. <laughs> I know. I you can like, work anywhere you like. Do you guys want someone who can interview people? Uh, James Fraser, love that. <laughs> I know. I think love that's that. Two weeks. That's very, very English, Christmas. you know. Christmas starts, like December kicks off. It's like, okay, but year over. Don't you feel like that's the mood right now in markets generally? Come on. Oh, totally. Totally. You need to take a leaf out of Europe's book. Just like December 1st, it's like year over. Just you're like me or shut you it down. Somebody else. I, I'm just saying, just <laughs> shut it down. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Two top Democrats say President Biden should run for re election in 2024. In an interview with CNN, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Biden has been a great president, while Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he would support Biden all the way. The backing comes as some Democrats urge the party to look for a younger generation of leaders. At 80 year old, Biden is the oldest president to hold office. Members of the European Union have reached a deal on a ninth package of sanctions on Russia. They target Moscow's access to drones, more banks and officials said to be responsible for kidnapping children from Ukraine. There are also export restrictions and chemicals on technologies used for military purposes. In the UK, consumer confidence is lingering near a record low for an eighth month. That's according to a survey by GFK. The results show the impact that rising prices and the possibility of a recession are having on UK households. And workers at 50 Starbucks locations in the US are starting a three-day strike today. They say the company isn't bargaining fairly with stores that have recently unionized. The labor group called Starbucks Workers United has prevailed in elections at about 270 Starbucks stores this year. The company says it hasn't engaged in anti-union activity. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. What happens when China, the largest commodity consumer in the world, the largest oil importer in the world, begins to rebound significantly in the first part of next year? It's going to tighten all of these markets tremendously and put a lot of upward pressure on prices. Jeff Curry at Goldman Sachs looking for triple digit crude again in the back end of next year. And Bramo, it's all about CapEx or the lack thereof 
earlier this year. If you were looking for a rebalance to this com commodity market, Jeff Curry and the team at Goldman saying, you're not getting one. And the super cycle is still there and still intact. And we're hearing this from a lot of uh, the big Wall Street banks that were honestly wrong where we would end the year in terms of it being double digits. And somehow we see dropping oil prices, even as China reopens wholesale early. Down a little bit today, down 2% at 79.58. But Jeff's not alone. I think Francisco Blanche at BFA looking for triple digit crude through next year as well. Does this go to what Jensen's talking about over at Bridgewater? Inflation, China back online, demand pops back in, clicks back in and crude is going up. It makes complete sense to me. I'm going to be completely honest. It absolutely makes sense. Rita Sen over at Energy Aspects saying the exact same thing. And right now you have basically a ghost town in Beijing as a result of everybody being sick and everybody staying home. Nuts, isn't it? But when that changes, and it will change. Of course it will. Then all of a sudden you could have a very different economic backdrop with a very different and increased demand. Uh, We're not going to get that clean reopening. We didn't get one in the West. It's going to be bumpy. It's going to be lumpy. But ultimately, to your point, you get through these waves and demand starts to pop back in. I would argue that it will be actually less bumpy if they're just letting it go. Because if they don't even try to lock it down and they're just basically not reporting any of the deaths, which is what's happening right now, and not reporting any of the infection numbers, but the morgues are reporting that they're cremating many more people than they had previously, and all of a sudden you just let it rip, then there will be a collective immunity that might come for you sooner. Sure, but in the near term, you know how this works. People self-regulate even if the government doesn't, people are self regulate and you're seeing the mobility numbers. And I think we're already seeing that. You see that on trading floors. I can't believe the volume's down off the back of this reopening in China. I've seen some of the statistics around that story in FX. I want to bring you a flavour of the price action right now. Equities are down, lower, negative. Soft to buy 1% on the S&P. Futures are down across the board here. Yields up just a little bit in the United States, up a whole lot more in Europe. We'll touch on that later. Up four or five basis points on a 10-year in America, 349. Crude softer, we talked about that. Euro dollar, not doing much to Today, 106.35, almost completely unchanged. Joining us now is Olga Kakova, the Deputy Director for Energy Security at the Atlantic Council Global Energy Center. Olga, I want to start with you on a story we talked about with Maria Tadeo, our colleague, about 40 minutes ago. And it was price caps in Europe. And you're looking at Hungary as an important case study. What are the lessons that you've learned from Hungary's experiment with trying to cap prices through this year? So Hungary has had a gasoline price cap for about a year, and I think it's really important to take a look at what has happened and what did the price cap lead to. And basically, long story short, it led to the shortage of gasoline on the market. So I think we need to take that as a lesson and apply that to price caps when we talk about natural gas. Um, as you're seeing, uh, the leaders across Europe are trying to figure out what that ceiling for the price cap for natural gas will be. The original 275 um, proposal uh, was criticized because initially it was not going to distort the market significantly. And in a way, that's a good thing because you're trying to attract additional LNG shipments. You're trying to attract more. This is a supply crisis. So, but right now, countries are saying, well, that is too high. We need to find ways to alleviate pressure on the consumers, on the industries. But, you know, there's other ways, of course, to do that. And price caps is one of them. And, of course, the risk is that it could divert shipments to more lucrative markets. And it could also discourage uh, efficiency measures and conservation. Olga, the fact that you have European leaders coming together to negotiate something that could potentially not dampen demand, increase demand, and just exacerbate the problem ultimately, does that indicate to you, Olga, that there really is no solution right now that is plausible to refill the coffers ahead of next winter in Europe? I think it just showcases that there isn't easy, one, just one big solution that's going to fix this chronic supply crunch. And, you know, frankly, this started before this horrible war it, that kicked off in February 24th. This started last year around this time. It, chronic underinvestment is what led to the situation partially. And, of course, Putin took it to the extremes and truly exacerbated where Europe is right now. Um, it also showcases the pressure that European leaders are under right now to provide some kind of answer, some kind of a solution. Um, as you know, there is, you're, you're right, the, there's uncertainty, first of all, around this winter. But most importantly, this is not just a one winter crisis. Next winter is really, really worrisome because there's really uh, little information around how much, uh, how many shipments from, how much gas we will be able to get from Ukraine, from uh, from Russia to um, to Europe. Also, you know, you know, you mentioned in an earlier story the increased demand in China and Asia. Um, you know, this year the reason why the storage levels are so high was because a lot of those Chinese shipments were diverted to Europe. 
with COVID restrictions loosening up, we can't anticipate the same, the same scenario. So next winter is truly worrisome, and it's going to be a combination of uh, demand destruction, efficiency measures, and yeah. really trying to wrap up those uh, actual investments in the energy both on the fossil side and on the renewable side. This is kind of sensitive, but there has been a discussion about trying to lock in natural gas contracts from Qatar uh, as Europe tries to plan for a, a different kind of dependence on different alliances. How does the recent controversy in Brussels with the potential for bribery and some kind of scandal around giving certain perks to Qatar affect those discussions of using it as one of the main sources of natural gas, given their ability to produce it? Look, I think the biggest learn lesson learned from, from the energy crisis is that, you know, energy does not exist in a vacuum. Energy and geopolitics and all of, all of these other global events are so closely tied together, and we can't no longer ignore and put, you know, and, and treat them as, as separate sole issues, right? The other, you know, key lesson that we learned, it's all about diversification, so that when you do have these kinds of conflicts, these kinds of controversial things arise, you're not in a position where you're certainly relying just, you know, you're switching from reliance on one supplier to another. Uh, the, the name of the game is diversification, having as many different options on the market. That way, if something happens with one of the players, um, you can you can go somewhere else. You can bump up supplies from and pull those supplies from the market from somewhere else. Olga, you've touched on the heart of the issue. It's not this winter. It's next winter. Given what you know right now, could you give us your best effort to describe what you think next winter is going to look like when it comes to energy in Europe? I think it will depend on several factors. Once again, how robustly, how quick the Asian demand will roar back. I think it will also depend on if there are additional further attacks on critical energy infrastructure across Europe, because that could potentially take out some supplies. Let's take as that example, you know, Norway's robust infrastructure. If there's anything that happens to that, that is going to take an, you know, huge amount of supplies to Europe uh, off the market. Um, you know, it all, it's all about the cold snaps this winter too. So you're thinking, you know, how does this winter impact the next winter? It's all about how low the storage levels are once we come out in the spring, because the lower the storage levels are, the more Europe will have to backfill to get ready for the next for the next winter to get around that 100 BCM filled up. Um, so all of these factors are playing in attention. Um, I think also how well Europe does with its efficiency measures in demand destruction without destroying the industry, without you know hurting the household. So a combination of all of these uh, factors uh, will will is, is the answer here. I, I so get it. I know it's really really answer. complex, but I guess I'm just asking for your best guess based on what we experienced in the last six months. Is it realistic expected expecting to go into next winter with storage levels where they were coming into this winter without Nord Stream and without policies that really curtail demand? So I'll give you my take. Um, IEA put out this assessment that there's going to be potentially a 30 BCM shortage. You know, I actually think that's on the more optimistic side because I do think there's a lot of things that could happen that could, you know, especially if we come out with lower storage going into the spring, I think that 30 BCM could actually be switched out into 40 and 50 and even more. More additional thing in that assessment that IEA did with the 30 BCM result, um, you know, there was also assumed that the carryover from this year of the 10 BCM and industry destruction, which we don't want, we want the industry to continue working, and you know, we really don't want to carry that over to to next year. Uh, you know, you want that economy to 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 continue growing. Yeah. Um, you know, so you know, if we were to translate that over again, like that's not that is not that is not the end goal. So I would say. On the brighter side, you know, let, let's take that IEA assessment, but I'm not feeling as optimistic. I would say there's a whole lot of room for additional shortages. I think a lot of people share that view. Olga, thank you. Olga Kukova over there thank of you. the Atlantic Council. Thank you very much. It's very, very difficult to make a call for 12 months from now. Think about the calls we were making 12 months ago, looking 12 months out and how wrong they've been. War kicking off in Europe, energy crisis. Have we got through this winter OK? So far, so good. But teeing things up for next winter, not looking great. It's even more difficult to make a call when it's hard to even understand what's going on right now. Uh, not only on the ground with supply and demand dynamics, but also just in general with policy. You heard Olga just list the variables yeah. that go <laughs> into just... a calculation like that. It was just going on and on. Emily Roden joins us next from John Hancock. Looking forward to that. Equity futures right now down by about 1% on the S&P 500. Live from New York City with Bram Oak. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK's back Monday. This is Bloomberg.
Inflation has turned, but there is evidence that it is sticky. We're now transitioning to this environment where central banks are divided over how do you wrestle with inflation rates. For the ECB, for the Fed, it's all about real rates. Central banks have kept interest rates too low for too long. In some respects, um, you know, I think the Fed's been dealt a better hand than the ECB. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. TK is so done with 2022, he's not showing up for work today. And good on him, because I agree. From New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. With Lisa Abramowitz, I'm Jonathan Farrow. Futures down by a little more than 1% on the S&P 500. It has been a week full of central bank speak. And it hasn't gone the way that people thought. They thought that if they got a weaker than expected CPI, as we did, that it would mean that suddenly you'd get relief from central bankers who would say, actually, we're OK now. We can step down and we can uh, consider whether we have to do that much more. And that was not what we got. You know what we did get? Just a bit of a disconnect in the bond market with equities. Equities lower, treasuries up, yields down. That's a break. That's a break. And I wonder if that's setting the stage for what we might see going into 23. Bonds are not buying what the Fed is selling. If you believe that the bond market is the smarter market, the more accurate market, then perhaps there will be a bigger reset in the economy. I don't know that they have any edge, though, on the Federal Reserve at this point. And a lot of people are just saying they're wrong. And this is just positioning. And also, it's a huge disconnect from what's going on over in Europe, where there is a reset. Isn't that the recession trade starting to kick in? Isn't that a flavor? Just a little bit of a scent of a recession trade starting to kick in as well. So the recession trade is kicking into the bond market, but not the stock market. And in the stock market, you have an increasing number of people coming on this show and saying the more likely outcome is you see resilience in the first half of next year. Because so far, companies are doing OK. They are still hiring. You are not seeing layoffs. We, we saw, saw Delta. That. Delta Airlines just saying, yeah, profits are going to be good going into year and they're going to be better next year. That's what we're hearing across the board. American Airlines actually increased the threshold for your miles. I have a feeling you're familiar with this, for your miles to get certain perks. And I was looking at that. You don't do that unless you have pricing power, unless you have the upper hand over your clients. So we're spending a ton of time trying to look out to 2023. Can we talk about 2022 and where we are right now? No. I think where we are right <laughs> now is really, really increasingly so difficult to understand. Retail sales yesterday, down the most in 11 months, slow down, right? Yeah, 45 minutes later, you got factory production, declined for the first time since June, slow down, all on board, okay. Then you look at jobless claims at around 200K. Hard to make the argument that we're seeing that labour market adjustment that this Fed chair would like to see, just based purely on jobless claims, in and around 200K. How do you understand retail sales that look just at goods, where you're seeing the discounts, where you're seeing the disinflationary forces, but that don't include services, where you're seeing the jobs, where you have companies that want to hoard labor because they just had an experience where they couldn't hire people quickly enough and they still see demand going up. It is such a complicated moment. Just added to all of this is the backdrop for oil, for energy prices, for gasoline prices that have fueled a feeling of ease. Again, a very difficult picture going into 2023. A thing for this program this morning, that's for sure. Good morning to you. I just want to whip through the price action just briefly. On the S&P 500, we are lower. Futures are negative by about 1%. We're negative on the Nasdaq as well. In the bond market, yields are just a little bit higher uh, by five basis points on a 10-year in America. I can tell you up a whole lot more in Europe. On a 10-year in Italy, up another 18 basis points after moving 30 yesterday. And in Germany, can I just share the curve with you in Germany? Please. Twos out to tens in Germany. This is the move today, up another 11, you can call it 12 basis points on a German two-year. Bramo, 245 on a 10-year up another 10 or 11 basis points to 218. We've had a real sell-off in the European bond market. Christine Lagarde, I would argue, was perhaps more direct than what we heard from Jay Powell. Brutal. A little bit more, maybe, I don't know. And she was just like, stop it, guys. Just stop it. We're not going to do it. How many times do I have to say this? How many languages do I have to do this? Well, we're here for more Fed officials today. And perhaps they'll be a little bit more direct. And that is what I'm actually curious That's to That's the hear. tease for today. More That's Fed it. speak. <laughs> and I'm done. No, Fed speak. <laughs> Let's talk about what it is. Fed president uh, of the New York Federal Reserve, John Williams, will be joining at 8.30 a.m. along with Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes. San Francisco Fed President Mary Daly at noon. Our own Michael McKee will be a having a conversation with Cleveland Fed President Loretta Mester at 3.30 p.m. Look for 
the pushback because that is what I'm expecting we will see. 9.45 a.m., the latest slew of data coming out. It's the only data that we're really getting of significance today. S&P Global, U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMI for December. Do you get a six straight months of deceleration in terms of some of the activity here? And on Sunday, it is the World Cup, and it is what everybody just wants to get to so that they can be done with the week. France versus Argentina. Who's your favorite here? I'm not making a call on this oh, game. Oh, come on, I'm please. Not, I'm not participating. I'm a journalist without bias. Oh, the, come on. Come on, everyone believes yeah, that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> you have no interest whatsoever. Coming come up on. a little bit later this hour, uh, Manus Cranny. Totally punted. From Doha. Looking forward to that conversation. And in the next segment, AMH and Maria Tadeo offering their <laughs> critical analysis of how they think this game's going to play out on Sunday. And Maria not holding back over who she thinks is going to go home with a trophy. Joining us now, Emily Rowland, co-chief investment strategist at John Hancock Investment Management. Emily, fantastic to catch up with you, always is. I just want to pick up on a theme that I know you're drilling down on. The equity bond performance this week, Emily, you've picked up on it as well. What's it telling you? It's actually pretty refreshing to see that diversification is working again. You have stocks down on the week, bonds up on the week, and that's the type of reaction that makes sense to us. Markets have almost been in this state of being comfortably numb given the fact that central banks are implementing the most tightening that we've seen in a generation. The economic data are suggesting that a global recession is likely into 2023. The yield curve is wildly inverted to the tune of 78 basis points, and earnings are starting to come off. Those are all things to us that suggest that a recession is likely, and we've seen cyclical areas of the market showing leadership. We've seen European equities having their best quarter, their, their one of their best quarters in years, and a lot of that cross-asset performance to us just hadn't been jiving with the macroeconomic backdrop. So we're starting to feel a little bit better that things are working as they should. But Emily, this goes against this idea that perhaps we have to have a different playbook this time around. And this is what we've been talking about for a number of weeks now, that we're not necessarily going back to the pre-pandemic uh, investment thesis where if something goes wrong, central banks lower rates and that fuels a risk rally. So does it make sense to you that the relationship between stocks and bonds is reverting back to something that it has been traditionally at a time when nothing about this moment is traditional? Yeah, I mean, we think that the playbook is really, you know, you can't, you got to still rely on history here. And we do think that given the fact that the economy is likely to contract next year, central banks ultimately will be cutting in the back half of next year. So we want to be positioned for that. We want to lean into bonds here. We like the idea that bonds are working in a portfolio. And you know, Matt Miskin and I have been talking a lot about the fact that income is very attractive and very competitive versus other parts of the market. So we do think that that playbook comes through again uh, into next year, but it's gonna take some time. The Fed has been incredibly just dogmatic in their approach to fighting inflation. We've heard it time and time again, but we know that the Fed is looking at lagging economic data, employment, inflation, especially services inflation. Many of your guests have talked about the fact that it's very, very sticky, and it's probably going to be too late uh, for the Fed to uh, really sort of reverse course uh, quickly into next year. They're going to cause this economic slowdown, and then they're going to have to cut. So, Savita Subramanian, uh, this is something that John has been talking about, really pointed out that there still is this feeling that if that is the playbook, then go into big tech, and that's what so many people are doing. And she pushes back against that and says that doesn't necessarily seem like the prudent play. Where do you feel on the leadership, on which are the stocks that can continue to drive upward some of the equity performance at a time if we're reverting back to a playbook that's familiar? Yeah, I would agree. The playbook from a cross-asset perspective within equities might be a little bit different this time. It was always that, you know, we looked to grow stocks. We wanted companies that were able to, you know, produce that organic growth in a slowing backdrop, and now we're not really seeing that. A lot of the growth in technology stocks was pulled forward during the height of the pandemic. Think about all the stuff that we bought, whether it was online shopping or you know conferencing tools or laptops for the kids. A lot of that growth and demand was pulled forward, and so we're seeing this period in which the baton is being handed over to the old economy. You know, we look at the value side of the house, which is showing some resilience here. So we want to be thoughtful about where we're going in growth 
where we're going in value. Areas like healthcare, one of our favorite sectors, very high quality, great balance sheets, cash on their balance sheets, organic growth drivers. But we also like your kind of classic S&P 500 tech companies, ones with a lot of cash. We don't want to own companies that need to tap the capital markets in order to grow. We don't want to own unprofitable technology companies in this environment, but but some areas, carefully selected areas of the technology complex to us still make sense paired with value. So, Emily, one thing that you've said is that for the most part, equities are not acting like a recession is coming. Can I ask you where you would look for that and where you think we are further along in the adjustment process, perhaps relative to other parts of the equity market? Yeah, it is so amazing to see this re-rating in stocks that began in the beginning of the quarter. We saw the S&P 500 start at 15 times forward earnings, and now we're trading at around 17 and a half, which is, means that stocks are now more expensive than their 20-year average. So we've seen this big re-rating, especially in more cyclical, economically sensitive areas of the market. Energy stocks doing better, even with oil prices coming down a bit. Pretty notable dynamic here. So we would look to find areas that are already priced for a recession. There aren't many. Uh, we, Matt and I have used the analogy of there's an equity store and a bond store for your for your Christmas shopping. And, you know, the equity store, there's not very much on sale. Areas like mid-cap value stocks, we like, they're trading at a steep discount already at 2008, 2009 levels. But the fixed income store, there's where a lot of the opportunity, where a lot of the bargains are. You look at investment-grade corporate bonds, seeing this big uh, price decline similar to 08, 09 levels. We like that. We like the income there, the total return potential. So, again, favoring the bond store over the equity store during this uh, holiday shopping season. Remember when you were a kid and your parents would say, you can't get anything from there, and that's where you wanted to shop. It was the toys. <laughs> they were expensive. Tell me more, Josh. And then your parents came along and said, you've got to get that. You need a new coat. I feel like that's what Emily Rowan is telling me right now. It's like, don't look at stocks. Go to the bond store. Who wants to shop at the bond store? No one's wanted to shop there for 10 years. Okay, what was the most disappointing gift you've ever gotten? When I was a kid, I didn't like getting clothes. I was very against clothes. And I remember my nan turning around to me and saying, John, in 20 years' time, this is all you'll want. You'll just want nice clothes. You won't want toys. And I was like, yeah, but I'm not, you know. <laughs> but I'm still this age. I'm, I'm not 30 Let me now. Be. I'm like Let me 10. be there. I don't want clothes, God bless her. So please, if you're listening, I love, no clothes. Love clothes now. Love clothes <laughs> Depends. now. Although I was thinking the other day, you know what? I'd love a toy car for this Christmas. Just a remote controlled one. I'd love that. I'm <laughs> no actually way. thinking, I'm thinking no about, way. I'm thinking Who about buying trolling? one for the apartment. You absolutely are trolling I'm serious. Somebody. I'm thinking about buying one for the apartment. Mm. I want like a toy Ferrari, like okay, a yeah, Formula sure. One car with a, a remote control. And you build like a little set. Because when I was a kid and I had a toy car, it had that cable attached to it. Do you remember that? And you had to like, yeah, sort of yeah, follow yeah. it because it wasn't right, remote right, control. Right. You want like a real one. I want a proper one, like a really fast one. <laughs> I'm going to <laughs> go out into Central Park with Tom and play with it. We never said thanks to Emily. Emily, thank you. Have a wonderful Christmas. Equity uh, Futures, down 1%. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Russia has launched another large-scale missile attack on Ukraine. Several cities have been hit, including the capital, Kyiv. Widespread power outages have been reported. The attack comes a day after a top Ukrainian army commander warned that there's no doubt Russian forces will try to seize Kyiv as soon as next month. A Russian assault in the spring failed. In Beijing, a rapidly spreading COVID outbreak has turned the Chinese capital into a virtual ghost town. That underscores the cost of President Xi Jinping's sudden pivot away from COVID zero. Anecdotal evidence suggests entire families and offices in Beijing have become infected in the span of just days. That could be a preview of what the rest of China faces. Boeing is closing in on an order for as many as 200 of its 737 MAX jets from Air India's new owner, Tata Group. Bloomberg's learned the two sides are trying to wrap up talks before the holidays. Tata is working on rebuilding the formerly state-run airline. And workers at 50 Starbucks locations in the U.S. are starting a three-day strike today. They say the company isn't bargaining fairly with stores that have recently unionized. The labor group called Starbucks Workers United has prevailed in elections at about 270 Starbucks stores this year. The company says it hasn't engaged in anti-union activity. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
Down 1% on the week, down another 1% on the session. Live from New York, about two hours away from the opening bell. Here's the price action for you. Equity futures soft and negative lower down by a little bit more on the S&P 500. Futures are off by a little more than 1%. Looking at Nasdaq futures right now, negative by 7 tenths of 1%. That's the equity story. Here's the bond market price action. Twos, tens and thirties. Yields just a little bit higher at the long end on tens by, let's call it five basis points to let's call it 350 on a 10 year, on a two year, 425. And remarkably stable over the last couple of days, I've got to say, even in the face of a vicious sell off. In Europe, we can finish on the European bond market. Bunds up yesterday, flying. Up again today by 11 basis points. The Italian 10-year was up 30 basis points yesterday. It's up another 17, 4.34% on a 10-year. QT is about to commence. QT light, maybe in yeah. early 23. But the pushback on rates and the rate path through 23 from President Lagarde was so firm. No ifs, no buts, no maybes. No, on the one hand, this, on the other hand, that. Just really forceful language from President Lagarde, even going into the tail end of that news conference. Which is why you saw the biggest sell-off by one measure in the German two-year going back to 2008. Maria Tadeo, I thought, was really interesting, talking about the Italian finance minister. Unhappy. Not exactly thrilled. They're not going to be. No, I mean, at a certain point, especially if you're heading into a downturn. Just to walk through some of the uh, stocks that are moving today, if anyone is out there looking at anything other than just taking vacation. American Airlines, which might get you there, actually came out and tightened up their frequent flyer status and their loyalty programs, which ballooned. And so they raised the threshold to really come into some of the perks. And, and John, I thought you'd care about this. It's down more than 1%, but it also really is not the only one. There are a host of airlines that are doing this. This does not indicate that they're concerned about demand, if they can do this. I can tell you, to get status at American is actually really difficult. You need to fly a lot. The bar is not low compared to something like, say, United, where I've noticed the bar is exceptionally low to get status. <laughs> but they're actually tightening it up even further Crazy. from there. And it's because they don't want the crowding. They don't want to lose the revenues. And they don't have to. Again, that's what I find so interesting. So the crowding where? At the check-in? It's the check-in crowding they don't like? Is it the check-in in the lounges that they don't like? What is it? It's part of the earlier boarding, the free upgrades, okay. the idea sort of, of having all of the perks. It's basically pay more, get less. I mean, that's basically what my interpretation of the airline industry. They want to make it more exclusive? Yeah. Okay. That's, I guess, what some people uh, would like to see. Amazon falling after J.P. Morgan cut its price target on the stock to $130 from $145. Part of this has to do with the cloud, AWS, uh, but part of this also just has to do with margin compression, and we've seen this across the board. And Meta is surging, shockingly, given how the rest of the tech universe is doing almost 2%, as J.P. Morgan raised its recommendation on the stock to overweight cost discipline. That's a story. Discipline's back. 2023, you wonder how these tech names are going to adjust to it. We're already seeing it from Meta. You mentioned Amazon. I wonder if Jassy makes a bigger push there as well through next year. If people actually have to turn up in suits. And I'm not saying they should all wear suits. I'm just saying, you know, no, I, if you know I think defining the last decade of zero rates and QE is Zuckerberg going around with a hoodie on a roadshow in those days are over. I would agree with that, and you're seeing that in the layoff numbers that we're seeing from some of the tech companies. Big time. Let's get to Sabatra Japa, head of U.S. rate strategy at SockGen. Sabatra, your quote from your piece last night. Can I say it was great, by the way? I had a good read of it. Powell stuck to his script of higher for longer after delivering a 50 basis point hike. A hawkish shift in the dot plot failed to nudge yields higher. You went on to say, though, and I think this is real pushback from the consensus view going into 23, we expect a modest rise in yields in Q1 as central banks deliver more hikes. So, Patrick, can we start there? What do you think other people are missing going into next year? Well, I think the price action right now is not reflective of what we should expect next year. You're getting into the year end. Liquidity is very poor. People are pairing back positions. But you're looking at, you know, the Bank of England, uh, you know, poised to deliver another 50 basis point rate hike. The ECB is, you know, perhaps going to de deliver another 50 basis point rate hike. So global central banks, broadly speaking, are still going to remain somewhat hawkish for at least the first quarter to first half of next year. So under those circumstances, I don't see why we, you know, yields can't adjust modestly here. I'm not calling for significantly higher yields, but I think if you get towards maybe 375 or 4 percent, that's not, uh, you know, necessarily out of the realm of reason. I feel like the market is, especially 10 yields, are very rich as they stand right now. At 350. So can we talk about the front end as well, just so I can get a better idea of where you think the curve is going to be, how you think that's going to evolve next year too? Right now, 425. How are you thinking about that, Sabadra? Well, I don't think the front end has a lot more room to rise unless we expect 
um, the, uh, the the Fed to hike beyond five and a quarter percent. But on the long end, the dynamics are very different. You're going to see a lot of corporate issuance come into the market. Uh, you're going to see perhaps uh, you know more even treasury issuance. Uh, typically, those tend to at least uh, support a little bit of a bearish momentum. To that, add add the fact that I think bonds have more yields. So bond yields have more room to rise. I think that 10-year yields could uh, see a push higher at least in the first quarter before we start seeing yields decline in the second half. Subhadra. I completely buy what you're saying. So does the Federal Reserve. This is what the Fed is basically telling the market is going to happen. Why are so many people pushing back? I think there's a concern about a recession in the U.S. To me, those concerns are a little bit premature. Uh, at SockGen, we have a little bit of an out of consensus view on uh, the recession in the U.S. We think that's an early 2024 event. It's not a 2023 event. So my real concern is that the market is not fully appreciating the fact that come middle of next year, if the unemployment rate is not heading towards 4%, we're still stuck at, say, 3.7, 3.8, and wages are still pretty strong, the Fed might have to go beyond five and a quarter. I'm not saying that that's our base case scenario, but that's a risk scenario that the market is not fully appreciating. What's your base scenario, Subhadra, of how long it will take to get back to 2% inflation, given what the Fed has already signaled? I mean, we got the summary of economic projections from the from the Fed. The Fed doesn't expect inflation to get to two percent in 2025. So you're looking at you know a very strong trajectory towards high, you know inflation remaining sticky after that initial descent. Now we're rejoicing the initial descent, but what if we get to maybe three percent or three and a half percent, and then inflation stays there and it's sticky at that level? At that point, I think the, the Fed is, is still going to remain somewhat hawkish if the employment picture is relatively strong. And there's a good chance the employment picture remains relatively strong, given the fact that we have such a mismatch in the labor market between job openings and, and available employ, employees to, to fill those jobs. So I'm not saying that the labor market is going to be as tight as, as it is right now next year, but I think it's going to, it could potentially take a lot longer for the employment picture to weaken meaningfully from here on. Emily Rowland was speaking earlier about the fixed income shop. There's a fixed income shop and then there's the stock shop. And that the fixed income shop has a lot of good things in it, including investment grade debt, because of how much it has been sold off. That has been on rate story, though, not necessarily the credit side of things. Given your projection that we might not get back down to 2 percent uh, inflation based on what the Fed is looking at themselves by 2025, does that default rate kind of expectation? Does that premium have to rise substantially from where we are right now? You know, our corporate strategists don't think the default rates rise in this cycle. I think we're in a very different environment, you know, relative to the 2008 uh, timeframe or the great financial crisis. Uh, I think companies are in a very good spot. You know, one metric that we look at for recessions is corporate profit margins. Corporate profit margins are still very, very healthy. So for the most part, under the circumstances, it's really hard to envision a scenario where the, de the default rates are going to rise uh, meaningfully from here on. So I think the corporate sector is you know, relatively robust. If we get a lot of supply next year, we're expecting a decent amount of demand from a variety of investors because the yield you get for holding uh, U.S. bonds is quite, uh, you know, quite substantial relative to yields in other regions. So I think for the most part, this is going to be a bond story next year. And it's going to be for, for yield and return. So, Badger, just one final question. What pivot? This was the title that came from the team at SockGen. The jumbo rate hikes are over, but we are far away from a monetary policy pivot. Can we just end on where you see terminal rates? Just around this, I think that's a headline for a lot of people. Where's the terminal rate at the Fed? Where's the terminal rate at the ECB? Is it basically in line with what's being priced right now? So for the for the Fed, I think the market and the Fed are are, are well aligned. I mean, I think the, the market expects the term of Fed funds rate maybe around five five and a quarter percent. Uh, maybe it's a little bit underpriced right now uh, for next year, but not by a lot. For the ECB, I think there's still a lot more room for uh, you know for uh, the market pricing to rise higher. Our economists in Europe, uh, you know, now expect the ECB to raise rates to 3.75 percent. Wow. I don't think that that's fully, uh, you know, uh, priced into uh, into into uh, into the, uh, the the European uh, bond markets. So that's why we see more potential for the Treasury bond spread to narrow. I mean, it's you know, when we put out our outlook, we had the 10-year Treasury bond spread around 175. We were calling for it to come to around 115. Guess what? This morning we're already at 130. And we still see more room for that Treasury bond spread 
to narrow. So I think that the, that it's 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 quite uh, you know hawkish for. The ECB, we see more room for bond yields to rise relative to treasuries. I just never, ever thought they'd go this far. No way. Not even nine months ago. Six months ago. Never thought they'd go this far. So, Badra, thank you. Wonderful summary of the last week or so, looking ahead to 23 as well. So, Badra Shapra of Sokgen. Always instructive to have a look at which war the doves are fighting right now. Mario Santino at the ECB, out of Portugal, saying there's a low chance of rate hikes returning to 75 basis points. That's the fight they're having. They're basically trying to say, yeah, no more 75s, but I guess we've got to live with 50s. That's where the ECB's at. In other words, if you want to put this another way, everyone's a hawk. And the most dovish you get is just simply uh, fighting some of the biggest raid hikes that you've seen in history. When you say you never thought we'd get here, we never thought we would get off zero. Remember all those conversations sure. where people were saying you're never going to see positive interest rates in the euro region ever again. How much confidence do central bankers get from the fact that you do not see a default cycle? Subhadra was not saying that necessarily we're going to see that in the U.S., Europe, though, there is a question, perhaps a little bit more, especially with companies having issued debt at negative yields effectively, what that looks like when they have to refinance. You've got to remember that Mario Draghi never hiked interest rates in eight years at the ECB. So it wasn't unusual to make that call basically after what we've seen over the last decade. I remember in the depths of the pandemic to make that call. It seemed kind of logical, intuitive even. Looking ahead... Can the ECB hike interest rates? Probably not. Then inflation came, came through hard, and this ECB's had to adjust quickly. But this goes back to what I was uh, talking about with Howard Marks when he was saying that it's a sea change. This is a new environment, which raises a, a real issue with this idea that people have that we're going back to the playbook that worked last year, two years ago, three years ago, when re cutting rates was the response. Is that still the response if the poison is inflation, not disinflation? Talking about the poison, have you seen this from Semaphore? Goldman Sachs, according to them, set to lay off as many as 4,000 people wow. as the cost of its ambitious push onto Main Street takes a toll. I'll dig into that story for you and we'll pick up on the details of it in just a moment. From New York, this is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Two top Democrats say President Biden should run for re-election in 2024. In an interview with CNN, House Speaker Nancy Pelosi said Biden has been a great president, while Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer said he would support Biden all the way. The backing comes as some Democrats urge the party to look for a younger generation of leaders. At 80 years old, Biden is the oldest U.S. president to hold office. Members of the European Union have reached a deal on a ninth package of sanctions on Russia. They target Moscow's access to drones. More banks and officials said to be responsible for kidnapping children from Ukraine. They are also export restrictions on chemicals and technologies used for military purposes. In Peru, more na nationwide protests sparked by political turmoil. A judge has ordered that former president Pedro Castillo remain in custody for 18 months while he's investigated for alleged crimes of rebellion and conspiracy against the state. Demonstrators have demanded his release and new presidential elections. Private equity firm Advent International has agreed to buy satellite owner and weather forecaster Maxar for about $4 billion. Shares of Maxar more than doubled in pre-market trading, including debt. The transaction is worth about $6.4 billion. And Amazon has signed a deal with Games Workshop to develop movie and TV productions, starting with its popular Warhammer 40,000 franchise. And Warhammer is a sci-fi universe focusing on themes of conflict and galaxy-spanning empire. The franchise includes a popular video and tabletop games and more than 300 novels. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. expect inflation to start falling more rapidly, probably from the late spring onwards. But there is a risk that it won't happen in that way, particularly because the labour market and labour supply in this country is so tight. And that's why really we have to raise interest rates today, because we see that risk as really quite pronounced. Governor Bailey of the Bank of England looking ahead to 2023 and the potential to do 
even more. Looking at equity futures right now, down about 1% on the S&P 500. Weakness yesterday bleeds through into Friday. We're down across the board. In the bond market, yields just a little bit higher by four or five basis points on a 10-year 349 euro dollar, unchanged at 106.26. Let's get to Goldman and look at a stock right now in the pre-market. This from Semaphore. I'm going to share this reporting from them with you and read it verbatim. Goldman Sachs plans to lay off as many as 4,000 employees as it struggles to meet profitability targets and retreats from its gamble on Main Street banking, according to people familiar with the matter. The story goes on to read, managers across the firm have been asked to identify low performers for what could be a cut of up to 8% to its workforce early next year. Now, Lisa, I have to say, when I first saw that number... I thought they'd accidentally put an extra zero on the number because earlier this week, our own reporting indicated that they were looking to lay off maybe up to 400 people. But the latest from Semaphore, that's pretty dramatic stuff from Goldman Sachs, if that's right. Talking about 8% of the staff, I mean, this is a significant layoff, and it comes as there have been a lot of questions around CEO David Solomon's uh, quest for profitability. He fell short of that goal that he set in February Really, the targeting of the Marcus unit is one of the big questions that we have yet to understand. How much is this going to be isolated there versus a broader culling, especially in light of some of the slowdown that we've seen in deal making and capital markets activity? Just going further through this reporting, it goes on to read, in a typical year, between 2 and 5% of Goldman's employees are laid off or receive no bonus, zeroed out in industry parlance, a clear sign to start looking for another job. Like other firms on Wall Street, Goldman skipped those cullings in 20 because the pandemic made them insensitive and 2021 because boom time profits made them unnecessary. So if we can walk away, just step back from the Goldman story just for a moment. When we look at big tech right now and the financials, how much of this is just kind of, I don't like the phrase payback, but is that what we're making up for because of what hasn't taken place in the last couple of years? And that's what we saw at Morgan Stanley, because Morgan Stanley also had reports about cutting some of the staff, and it was bigger than expected, but it was just a fraction of the number of employees that it has over where it was pre-pandemic. So to your point, this is the reason why some of the layoffs that we're hearing about may not be indicative of a wholesale retrenchment in the employment market, but rather areas that got I don't want to say overstaffed, but overstaffed during the pandemic. Goldman stock right now down about 1%. We're going to try and get Shanali Basak on the phone, our Wall Street correspondent, in just a moment. We've got to head over to Doha as well. The World Cup final in just a couple of days. Argentina versus France for football's ultimate prize. Manus Cranny holding a football. He joins us right now outside the South Stadium. Manus, <laughs> walk me through how big the next 48 hours is going to be. It's going to be monster. It is going to be monster. They spent 45 billion bucks. I never understand what 45 billion bucks looks like. Let me show you. There you go. We're at Lucelle. That is a capacity of 88,000. Argentina is adding two extra flights to get their people here. Depends which hotel you stay in. And I'm not in the Four Seasons, let me add. I'm on the <laughs> periphery, but I play in the center. Excuse the pun. Uh, so I've been downtown, and it's a pretty, pretty cool atmosphere, i got to say. I'm out of my, my inner Bond guy is gone, and they've given me a ball to play with. This is Rogue. <laughs> Man, is, is that a regular-sized ball? Because it looks like it's a bit smaller than previous balls. I want you to know yeah. that we've spent the sum total of 60 reals, 60 <laughs> reals on this. Okay. We couldn't afford, All right. We couldn't afford the big ball. All right. Here great props. I like it. I'm curious about what the reception has been like in Doha when it comes to whether this was a success or not. What's your view? I think if you judge it by dollar spent, viewers, numbers, the most watched game in the United States of America for soccer, oh, it's football. For football in the US was US England, the most watched soccer game ever. So has it been, you know, a ramping velocity success for FIFA? Yes, seven and a half billion dollars breaking news now. That's what they've earned over this Qatar 2022 World Cup. So dollars spent, yes. Reputation, that is a whole other bandwidth. You can look at it from your side of the pond, which is about LGBTQ rights, labor workers' rights. You can also look at it from my prism, where I am here in, the, in, in Qatar. The Saudis came and visited. They were all hugging up one another. Mohammed bin Salman, the Althanis, a real rapprochement of the GCC. So it depends which prism you look at. Manasai, I miss you, buddy, so much, so much. And can I just say, can I make this statement? 
someone get Cranny a ticket for the final. Do you know he doesn't have a ticket for the final? <laughs> and he's, he's not staying at the Four Seasons? He's yeah. for the weekend. They've got to sort it out for you, Cranny. Good to see you, buddy, as always. This, man, is, this, Cranny. this is the worst expenses trip I've ever been on. <laughs> In Doha. <laughs> Almost complaining there. I think I think he was pretty upfront about complaining there, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. Two he days was. away. That's okay. Has it been successful relative to the amount of criticism it got coming into it? I think a lot of people might say yes. The football has been successful. The football has been successful. The amount of money they have taken in versus spent, not so much, a little disproportionate. And with respect to whether it actually emboldened the nation or gave it a better reputation globally, not sure that that can really be uh, conclusive either. I want to get back to that breaking news, that story from Semaphore. A little bit earlier on, five, ten minutes ago, Goldman Sachs planning to lay off up to 4,000 people. Shanali Basak's jumped on the phone for us. Shanali, I, I assume you've read through the story as well. What do you make of these headlines that have dropped in the last Listen, couple of minutes? Yeah, 8% is what this would amount to, according to Semaphore. That's about uh, 4,000 people or so. Listen, remember, if you put this in a comparison, for example, what you saw Morgan Stanley, Morgan Stanley's percentage cut was about 2%. I'd say Goldman has expanded pretty drastically over a set of acquisitions and hiring over the last couple of years. We talked to David Solomon just a week ago, and he hinted that pruning would happen. So this puts a number around how deep pruning goes, thousands, not hundreds. Uh, this will go into early next year, according to Semaphore. So this is in addition to the cuts we've already seen. Remember, if Goldman is doing this, you have to assume that other people are already also starting to think about whether it's time to start cutting some jobs after massive headcount increases the last couple of years. It's kind of very classic Wall Street behavior, isn't it? Um, I hire a lot in the good times, and then before things get bad is when you start to prune. Shanali, there's a real question, especially around Goldman Sachs, about whether this is going to be concentrated in the consumer-facing business, the Marcus uh, operations, or whether it will be broad-based, including some of the investment banking uh, units that have been incredibly successful. What's your sense, based on your conversations with leadership there? So, listen, it's the conversation we had in good times was whether you want to put money towards technology or whether you want to put money towards people. And that conversation gets even more significant in bad times. So even at a trading desk, for example, my question would be for Goldman is when you put that marginal dollar to work, are you going to put it to work at a star trader or are you going to automate your processes more in fixed income or other places? That is the strategic decision you have to make in a hard time into next year while you're protecting your margins. And by the way, one may pay off more than the other. And so you have to assume that low performers across every business line are going to be taken a look at. And, yeah, this is not going to be, from my understanding, just dedicated to Marcus. Although, remember, they did buy that business, Green Sky, in that consumer business that added uh, a 1,000 or so people in the last year. Shanali, we've got about a minute left. Let's just take a step back. You caught up with the CEO of Goldman only a couple of weeks ago. Was there any indication of this, just thinking back to that conversation, any indication yeah. whatsoever that something like this was coming? Totally. It was one week ago, John. I know this year is going really fast. <laughs> but he did say, he said more pruning would be likely to come. And again, the 8%, you have to think about it in perspective here. It is more than what we're seeing at Morgan Stanley. It's more than what we have seen announced at Citigroup or Barclays. But it has to be a harbinger of things to come here on Wall Street, which is why people pay so much attention to Goldman at this time. We'll see if the firm confirms the effort. A little bit later this morning, Shanali Vasek at Bloomberg. Shanali, thanks for jumping on the phone. We'll catch up with you a little bit later. Brahma, what do you make of that in the last 10 minutes? How unique Goldman Sachs is versus representative of the broader Wall Street trend. That's the real issue for me, is how much is this representing a lack of an ability to reach profitability targets, which a lot of people have raised a lot of questions about, including uh, investors versus something that is just more wholesale having to do with the environment, especially after how much they've beefed up. Again, though, you have to imagine deal making is going to slow a lot, and that's going to create a lot of pressure. Well, it has done this year, hasn't yeah, it? Yeah, it has. And is it going to really increase that much? I mean, this all goes back to that rates picture. If rates stay where they are, how many companies are going to want to refinance or make acquisitions? The latest from the news organization Semaphore. Goldman Sachs set to cut as many as 4,000 workers. Their stock is down by about 1%. Coming up, looking ahead to 23, Sam Stovall of CFRA from New York. This is Bloomberg.
We're going into this environment of slower hikes, fewer hikes. It's not a question just of how fast we raise rates. That's, that's a lesser important question now. It's how high and how long are we going to keep it there? Well, I think for the time being, they're very much focused on inflation. If uh, we are going to see inflation falling back, it is going to be a very much a challenge that is going to have to be met by probably a more aggressive policy reaction. We believe that early next year, the market will realize that inflation is sticky. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrell, and Lisa Abramowitz. Live from New York City this morning, good morning, good morning for our audience worldwide. This is Bloomberg Surveillance on TV and radio alongside Lisa Bravitz. I'm Jonathan Farrow. TK, back with us on Monday. He's taken a long weekend. We need to pick up with that Goldman news from 10 minutes ago. Goldman Sachs, according to Semaphore, could cut as many as 4,000 workers. And I have to say, Lisa, got to repeat what I said five minutes ago. I thought they'd accidentally put an extra zero on because we reported earlier this week the number might be 400. 4,000 is way above what we were looking for. And I'm going to repeat what you just said a minute ago as well and just say that there's a question about whether this is idiosyncratic to Goldman Sachs, idiosyncratic to the banking industry, or if this represents something broader, especially because the banking system usually is a bellwether of what's to come. And a lot of people have been saying these are the areas that built up their staff disproportionately, did not make cuts during the, uh, during the pandemic. So perhaps... They have more to cut, but it doesn't represent weakness in the labor market that a lot of people are looking for. 8% of the bank's workforce, that's the number. Got to see if Goldman confirmed any of this this morning, going into the weekend, coming out the other side, because that's a big report. That's a very, very large number to put out there. But our own reporting earlier this week indicated some cuts at a magnitude much lower than that, but some cuts at Goldman Sachs. We've reported on also a magnitude much lower over at Morgan Stanley. It's clear that there is a different tone on Wall Street, especially as the deal-making operation grinds to a bit of more halt. I mean, even the mortgage operations. Can you imagine what a mortgage banker is doing right I now? I know, it's tough. It's so, so difficult. If you go through the semaphore piece, it's interesting. It's not just about the business environment, it's about the past. And that wasn't just about the hiring, it was about the fact that they weren't laying off the people in the way they typically would. Because of the optics of doing so, given the economy that we were in at the time, with the backdrop being, we're still in a pandemic. It's fascinating to see how the last couple of years have played out and ultimately how it's going to play out now because of that through the next 12 months. We're seeing that with respect to layoffs at the tech companies as well. Where we're not seeing that are the areas that did lay off in mass. A lot of workers are shut down in the services sector when those services disappeared, when in, in terms of people just staying home. And now there still is that hiring. This is why it's such a complicated moment to understand the tightness or looseness in the labor market. So are we normalizing? Is that the right way to look at this? Are we normalizing in places like Goldman? When you go through that piece and they talk about the fact of what they used to do, what they used to do in a typical year is 2 and 5% of Goldman's employees are laid off or receive no bonus, and they haven't done that in the last couple of years. Could you say this is normalizing? Maybe. There's nothing about this moment that's normal. There's it's very difficult. There's nothing about that number that's exactly. normal. Exactly. So about that. I don't know that I can say that it's normalizing. Perhaps we're getting back to a new normal that we're establishing through a pretty rough process. In about 25 minutes, we'll catch up with the Fed's view on all of this because John Williams of the New York Fed is going to be speaking to Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes. That kicks off the Fed speak that you've all been waiting for. Did you say Mesters with Mike McKeel a little bit later this afternoon? 3.30 p.m. Looking forward to that. Mary Daly of the San Francisco Fed in the mix as well. You wonder if they're a little bit more blunt in a way that Chairman Powell was not, or whether we start to get a clearer view of just how much maybe things are starting to crack, just a little bit of dissent appearing on the FOMC that makes it difficult for the Fed chair to reflect a consensus that is not there when he goes into that news conference, because the difference between Chairman Powell and President Lagarde, you compare and contrast what we heard from President Lagarde yesterday and Chairman Powell on Wednesday, there was a lot more on the one hand this, on the other hand that, if buts and maybes from Chairman Powell. President Lagarde, no. Just bang, 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 straight down the middle. She understood the political side of it perhaps more than uh, Jay Powell did. I'll just editorialize on that view. That said, he also said that they're not going to cut rates, and their projections show that they're not going to cut rates. People just don't believe them. And at a certain point, John, you have to wonder, what data are they getting such confidence from that the Fed is looking past and saying, stop it? Goldman right now, down 8 or 9 tenths of 1%. Crystal ball time, looking out to next year. Here's some calls for you. Bank of America, 4K, year-end. 2023. Canna Fitzgerald, year end 2023, 4100. Credit Suisse, 4050. 4K Goldman Sachs, 4K HSBC. Jeffries, 4200. JP Morgan, 4200. Morgan Stanley, 3900. RBC, 4100. You get the picture here. There's a lot of people bunched around 4K. So be thankful that our next guest is saying something a little bit different. 4575. 
It's Sam Stovall at CFRA. So, Sam, walk me through why, ultimately, you're a lot more bullish than the bulk of the street going into 23. Hey, Jonathan and Lisa. Well, I guess some could accuse me of being a Pollyanna. Uh, I like to say that when life gives me lemons, I try to make whiskey sours. But what I'm looking at is the expectation that we are likely to fall into a recession. I mean, I'm saying right now that like a deflating holiday lawn ornament, the Powell press conference and today's Goldman news have drained investor hopes of avoiding a recession. But I think it's going to be a mild recession. I do think the Fed will continue to raise rates through the first quarter. But then I'm reminded of history saying that on average, eight and a half months after the last rate hike, we see the Fed starting to cut rates. So if we do end up seeing this economy getting weaker than are, is expected now by the street and also seeing what uh, the Fed responds to, uh, I think investors will be looking across the valley into the second half of 2023. And that's where we end up seeing an upward movement. And the real year-end target also depends on whether we simply retest the 3,500 low on October 12th or we set an even lower low. So what is your downside in the first half? Uh, downside, I'm thinking 3,500 for the S&P 500. That is the um, October 12th low. It is a Fibonacci retracement level of the prior um, uh, bull market move. Um, and also, I think that that was an area of significant support. Uh, and so that is my first level. So, Sam, if we get down to 3,500 and you're saying the recession is only short and shallow, why do you think the recovery in the equity market is as severe as the one that you're calling for in the second half? Where does that come from? What drives it? Well, uh, I'm a big believer in history. You know, history is a great guide. It's certainly not gospel. Uh, however, when you look to all of the bear markets since World War II that were accompanied by recession, uh, we ended up uh, coming back into a new bull market, meaning rising 20 percent in an average of only three months. And in five of those nine times, we ended up uh, in a new bull market after only one month. Also, what we found is that 12 months after, the market was higher by 47 percent on average, with a low water mark being 30 percent. So basically, it all depends on when that actual bottom takes place. Uh, and my feeling is that we are likely to then see this vacuum of valuations be taken advantage of. Sam, when you talk about history and you talk about post-World War II, have you ever gone back to 1918, right? I mean, is it a playbook that perhaps goes to another era of pandemics and then conflict as well in World War I and everything that was going on then? Is that a better kind of measure of where we could be and the sort of difficulty getting out of some of the issues that are facing not only the market, but also just generally geopolitical uh, peace? No. Uh, and I say that because, like uh, the valuing of crypto today, uh, we didn't really have the uh, required earnings information for individual investors to make decisions back prior to uh, the 1930s. Also, we never had government-supplied economic data uh, since the late 1940s. So really, uh, you should be looking at data only since 1950 or so. But I go back to World War II simply because that's sort of a, a dividing line. So I would say the reason I don't go back to the 19 teens is because it really was more of a, a gambling situation because you did not have the free flow of financial or government economic data. Is China reopening, Sam, a headwind or a tailwind to your call? I think it's going to be a, a tailwind globally. Uh, expectations at the beginning of 2022 were that we were going to see a 4.6 percent gain in global GDP. That estimate now is below 3 percent. The only and then when you look to 2023, it's even weaker. But if you look to China, uh, that's really the only country that is expected to show an improvement in GDP in 2023. Um, to a broader extent, the uh, emerging markets are likely to show an improvement in GDP ne uh, next year, whereas the advanced economies are predicted to show a slowdown. So uh, I would think it's going to actually be a, a, a tailwind for the global economy. It was so much easier when we used to talk about synchronized global growth. Do you remember that? Everything all at the same time. Now, looking out to 23, it's so, so different. Europe recession, US recession, China reopening, those two things colliding. Is inflation going to be sticky as growth rolls over? Bramo, that's going to be the call for 23. 
Where's energy prices? Where are they going to be? What about policy? I mean, honestly, pick your issue, and it's going to be just a moment of confusion and historical reference points. But you wonder whether the consensus is, and you point to this, too cute just simply because how do you have a consensus uh, with all these variables? Claims at 211. I think there's people looking exclusively at the, lab, the labor market and saying claims at 211. Goldman News aside, tech news to one side. Look at the labor market, look at the data. Where's the recession? It's not just the numbers in terms of the unemployment claims. It's also the numbers with respect to wage gains. They are accelerating. They are not disinflating. Hey, Sam, wonderful to catch up. Sam Stovall there of CFRA. They're cool. 45.75, 12-month price target on the S&P 500. What did Greg Jensen say over at Bridgewater well, about this, this China reopening story? I think that's really interesting. I thought this was fascinating. He Does basically he think it's was a problem? saying he thinks it's a big problem. He thinks it's going to be inflationary. He thinks that it's been a gift to the U.S. and Europe that China's been offline for a couple of years, not creating demand for uh, base commodities. When they come back online, it will be a big inflationary push at a time when Europe is entering recession and the U.S. is slowing down. So a very controversial take on the same event. I mean, this is this is the reason why it's such a complicated moment. A China reopening, is that a good thing or a bad thing to your investment thesis? So growth down, inflation sticky, terminal rate high for longer. Is that going to be the call? Get long energy, stay short tech? That's is what that what they're test. sticking with? Yeah, that's what some people are saying. I mean, are you saying from my personal call? No, I'm just wondering. I'm wondering what the, th what the thesis is around that call. I, that, that seems to be the case and that yields are going to be higher and it's a new investment regime. Okay. Well, in about 18, 19 minutes, we'll get the Fed's view on this. The core of the Fed, the chairman, the vice chair, and the head of the New York Fed. We're going to catch up with one of those, John Williams, the president of the New York Fed, sitting down with Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes in about 18 minutes. Look out for that on TV and radio. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. Another large scale Russian attack on Ukraine's infrastructure. A barrage of missiles knocked out power across Ukraine today. The capital of Kyiv was one of the cities hit. And that attack comes a day after a top Ukrainian army commander warned that there's no doubt Russian forces will try to seize Kyiv as soon as next month. A Russian assault in the spring failed. In Beijing, a rapidly spreading COVID outbreak has turned the Chinese capital into a virtual ghost town. That underscores the cost of President Xi Jinping's sudden pivot away from COVID zero. Anecdotal evidence suggests entire families and offices in Beijing have become infected in the span of just days. That could be a preview of what the rest of China faces. American Nobel Prize winner Philip Dibvig faces a sexual harassment inquiry at Washington University in St. Louis. A former student is the accuser. Bloomberg has spoken to seven former students who allege that Dibvig sexually harassed them. His lawyer says he never had any improper physical or verbal interactions. Dibvig won this year's Nobel Prize for economics. Goldman Sachs reportedly plans to cut as many as 4,000 jobs. That's according to the news outlet Semaphore, which says the cuts could amount to 8% of the firm's workforce. Goldman has been struggling to reach profitability tar targets. And private equity firm Advent International has agreed to buy satellite owner and weather forecaster Maxar for about $4 billion. Shares of Maxar more than doubled in pre-market trading, including debt. The transaction is worth about $6.4 billion. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg. judge that interest rates will still have to rise significantly at a steady pace to reach levels that are sufficiently restrictive to ensure a timely return of inflation to our 2% medium-term target. Our future policy rate decisions will continue to be data-dependent and follow a meeting-by-meeting -meeting approach. That was near the start of the news conference. Later on, I think increasingly President Lagarde lost some patience through the Q&A near the end. We're not pivoting, we're not wavering, we have more ground to cover, we have longer to go, we're in for the long game, just punch, 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 punch. 
You remember we talked about the hawkish greatest hits of Chairman Powell in the November news conference. It was kind of it from President Lagarde there yesterday at the ECB. But there was one message and one message in it alone. Oh, without a is, doubt. You are misinterpreting me every single time. I am being very clear. Do you think she rehearsed that? <laughs> in the mirror? Yeah. <laughs> there will be no pivot. We vote. Possibly. Well, the bond market's listening in Italy, unlike the Treasury market, which has not been listening to Chairman Powell. You mentioned a two-year, so let's talk about the front end of the curve in Italy yesterday. That was a 39 basis point move. That's not normal. On a two-year in Italy this morning, up eight basis points. And when you think about things that aren't normal, just bring up the German two-year on my screen and get you the last couple of days. Today, the German two-year is up seven basis points. The two-year yesterday, up 25, 26 basis points on a German two-year yield. That's pretty impressive, that move. It's shocking, considering where we've been and that we were negative for so long. It's also shocking to think that we're heading into a downturn and there will not be a fiscal response that is capable in the same kind of way if you're borrowing at these kinds of levels. And yep. that's why I think the Italian response to this, even behind closed doors... Hey, they're furious. ...is very interesting. And that's perhaps why you're seeing a bit of softness in the euro as well, because what does this mean in terms of the reaction function and, and sort of the offset to any kind of downturn? Uh, more rate hikes and a bit of QT. Shahab Jalanous joins us now, Global Head of FX Strategy at Credit Suisse. Shahab, what did you make of that from President Gard yesterday? It certainly beat most people's expectations in terms of uh, implied future rate hikes. Uh, our own economists at Credit Suisse now look for 3.5% uh, as the terminal rate uh, for the ECB, which is pretty high, higher than I would have expected a year ago. You think obviously. they're going to be there long? Uh, well, that's the thing. If you now start looking at uh, futures expectations in the interest rate curve, you're starting to see the inversion get much bigger. For example, if you look at uh, September 23 futures against September 24 futures in the Euribor strip. We're now looking at a 50 basis point inversion there. That was 37 basis points before this move. So the market, it can believe in the idea of the terminal rate being that high, I think, but it's not going to believe as much in the idea that it can stay that high. And I think that's going to be a, a weak link for the euro going forward. Well, and so in other words, given the fact that the ECB seems determined to yeah. move forward with this, is this going to be a parity type of situation for the euro again, or do you think that it will really break in terms of what the resolve will be from the ECB? No, I think it's probably more of a, a barrier to consistent gains for the euro rather than an instant reason for it to go back to parity. So if you look at the dollar, for example, um, at the end of September, we had the same 50 basis point inversion between September 23 and September 24. So for futures, now that's 150 basis points. So the market, again, was pushing down 2024 rates quite aggressively for three months, and the dollar fell throughout that period of time. I think we're, we're at a much earlier stage in this process for the euro. Um, I think the euro can go a bit higher still, but I'd be keeping a very close eye on exactly that same spread in the euro as well, because as that gets more inverted, uh, that takes away the steam, I guess, the energy behind the euro's this is ability what, to rise. This is what I'm struggling with, John. I mean, if you end up with a weaker euro on the heels of a hawkish proclamation from the ECB, I know. this increases the inflation risks in the euro region. How do they counter that? It was the problem earlier this year. We talked about it a few times. So, Shahab, I guess the big call for an FX strategist, regimes shift, they yeah. change, they adapt, they evolve. Sometimes it's all about rates differentials. Other times, it's just about risk sentiment more broadly in the market, maybe even the economy. What do you think is the most dominant factor right now? And perhaps what is going to be the dominant factor in 23 for this FX market? So certainly, rate differentials have been an important factor. That's why euro dollar is back at 106, you know, when we started below parity, you know, th this quarter. So I do think that that's a significant factor. But there's also the tra terms of trade story as well. If you remember, euro was not weak only because of rate differentials. It was weak early in the year, largely because of balance of payments shifts linked to very high energy prices. Europe's got lucky. We had a very uh, warm winter thus far. Um, and also, the energy supply problem has been less of, a, less of an issue than people thought. So that's another thing to think about. I think you've had both of those factors play into Euro's recovery. Can you just sit on the structural story for a moment? For a long, long time, there were complaints in Europe by the Europeans that the euro was too strong. Yeah. Draghi ultimately introduced negative rates in the summer of 2014 to fight against that and push back pretty hard, and we had some success. The Germans always got the blame for it, for running a surplus, a current account surplus across the eurozone. Even when we had difficult times on the periphery, that was something that persisted, and it meant we ended up with persistent euro strength. Are you seeing a structural shift away from what was dominant maybe 10 years ago? And what does it mean for this currency? There's definitely been a structural shift because now you have the euro area as a whole with a current account deficit 
Uh, and the big collapse in German exports is a large part of that, as well as the increase in, in energy imports uh, costs that, that's come through as well. Unless you think that's going to change quickly and go back to how things were, we have to assume there's been a structural shift that's going to persist. And the net result of that is a weaker euro than, than would have otherwise been the case. It also requires the euro to be supported more than it would have been in the past by higher interest rates. Um, but I think at least from that perspective, the ECB is delivering uh, as we're seeing. So that's, I think, one, one comforting factor if you're a euro bull at this point. That's the European side of things. From the U.S. perspective, we're less than 10 minutes away from hearing from New York Fed President John Williams after that speech that we heard from Jay Powell after the press conference. What would a truly hawkish Fed, or perhaps should I say the market believing what the Fed is saying, yeah. do to this dynamic? Would that actually give strength to the dollar or weakness just simply because it would indicate perhaps a weaker economy going forward? I think at the moment, the, uh, the burden of proof has shifted quite significantly uh, as far as what, what the data is showing. Previously, we were consistently beating uh, to the upside on inflation outcomes, and the market was chasing that reality. Now we've had two months in a row of downside misses. So the market doesn't really give the Fed all that much credibility in its predictive power because of what we've seen you know, in the last couple of years. Well, the particularly market, the last 12 months. Right, exactly. So it, it makes very little difference, I think, at this point, what the Fed says to the market's uh, reaction function. As we can see, if the market sees soft data, the market's going to run with that. And that's, that's the result of uh, what we've seen in the past with, in terms of Fed's communication strategies. And, and what's actually turned out to be the case in data. Uh, and you know, you're seeing that in the inversion of the curve that I mentioned. So the only way that's going to change, in my view, is if the data change, if we get a surprise upside print, for example, in inflation, or if the, the labor market simply doesn't deteriorate as quickly as people think. It's going to take a while before we see those numbers. So I think anything the Fed says right now is going to be uh, not that impactful on the market. A year ago, even after they dropped transitory, they were looking for 90 basis points worth of hiking in 22. We got 400 plus. The ECB president 12 months ago was basically indicating we might not get a rate hike through the whole of 2022. Look at where we are now. Even at the last meeting, the one before this one, it wasn't in the base case that we'd get a recession in the eurozone. A couple of months later, here we are talking about a recession in the eurozone and Q4, Q1 from Europe. So they've been dead wrong through all of this. And I think that's where the doubt comes from. What's interesting for me this week is why we believed the ECB a little bit more than we believed the Federal Reserve. So the credibility of their forecast has shot over the last couple of years, sure, completely agree, but for both central banks. But why were we paying more attention to the rate story that Lagarde was selling and not the rate story that Powell was selling? Is it the difference in the data? Perhaps it is, and I think that's what Shahab is alluding to. It's also this idea that they have not taken the decline in natural gas prices, the fact that there has been a more controlled uh, situation there as any kind of reprieve or breathing room, and that they didn't give any credence to that whatsoever. I, but to your point, it's a good question, uh, because both banks struggle with credibility. Shahab Jalanusa, Credit Suisse. Shahab, awesome to have you in the studio. Thank Thanks. you, buddy. As always, I want to go back to that Goldman story just briefly. This comes from a news organization in the United States called Semaphore. Goldman Sachs set to cut as many as 4,000 workers. The stock in the pre-market looks a little something like this, down about nine-tenths of 1%. But that number much, much bigger, a multiple bigger of what we expected a little bit earlier this week, Bramo, if it is indeed confirmed. And what, what we're seeing from our own reporting seems to be a person familiar with the matter telling Bloomberg this being the case as well. So more kind of hints that this could be very wow. much the case. Up next on the program, don't miss this. The New York Fed president, John Williams, sitting down with Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes, live on Bloomberg TV and radio later on this afternoon. Mike McKee and Loretta Mester will pick this all up in the next hour, counting it down to the opening bow with Jim Bianco, Rob Molnar and Judy Bill. This is Bloomberg. About an hour to go before the opening bell, we do see the softness from yesterday continuing a bit on going. We're also getting more insight with Bloomberg matching the, the reporting from Semaphore about perhaps 4,000 job cuts over at Goldman Sachs as they trim their workforce by a potential 8 percent in the wake of uh, two years of not really cutting staff and weakness in certain units. Right now across the board, you're seeing the S&P down about 1 percent. Euro, a bit of softness, a bit of dollar strength. And 
10-year yields a bit higher, but not anything like what we saw over in the European markets, 3.5%, basically, uh, 351 on the 10-year. Right now, as we look at Goldman Sachs and this question of all of the job cuts, there is a question of whether this is a broader story of layoffs and a weakening labor market, or if this is idiosyncratic with certain markets that have blown up in terms of the number of staff over the past few years. Right now, I am so pleased to say we can head over to the New York Fed. Bloomberg's Kathleen Hayes there with one of the leadership members of the Federal Reserve, New York Fed President John Williams, to answer some of those questions. Kathleen. Lisa, thank you. President Williams, thank you for joining us this morning on Bloomberg Television. So happy to have you. Here we are in the New York Fed Museum in a year when the Fed has been making a lot of history. <laughs> so let's start with uh, the, the meeting this week and what, what came out of it, because we got the you know, the, the move up in the to the restrictive rate that was even more restrictive than people thought. And, you know, inflation has stayed high. It's pretty hard to get down, probably harder than you thought it would mm -hmm. uh, just a few months ago. With these dots, with this position now, do you think you finally caught up to where you need to be? Well, I think we're, we're well on our way there. And I think when you look at uh, the kind of the central tendency of the dots. Uh, my colleagues expect the Fed funds rate to get to, say, 5 to 5.5% 5 uh, next year. I think that's a, that gets us uh, into that hopefully sufficiently restrictive stance of policy that will bring inflation back to 2%. So I am getting increasingly confident uh, that we're getting uh, closer to that point. Uh, but obviously, we have to watch the data. Uh, the inflation and other data have surprised us, and we, we need to be on the lookout for that. But I, I do feel we're in a, getting to a better place. Now, just about two weeks ago, you said that the Fed funds rate has to get above the inflation rate yeah. to bring down inflation. Uh, how far above inflation does it have to get? Well, that's, that's the question, right? In, in way we talk about this as in terms of sufficiently restrictive to bring inflation back to 2%. So to me, it's really about getting it high enough and, of course, keeping it uh, high for, a while, for enough time to really see clear signs of inflation is moving on, back down on, uh, on the way to 2%. You know, my view is you have to think about real interest rates, as you said. If you look at, again, the median dots, if you will, in the, in the economic projections that we just put out, you see the real Fed funds rate, say the Fed funds rate minus the core PC inflation, mm -hmm. around 1.5%. I think that's a reasonable view of uh, restrictive. Again, whether it's sufficiently restrictive, we'll have to watch the data and see. But I think that's, to me, uh, basically where, where I'm thinking right now. Now, there's many top economists former Fed officials even, <laughs> who are saying you're, uh, look, it's looking more and more like you are going to have to go higher, even than where you are now. Maybe something like six, maybe something heading towards 7%. Uh, can you see that happening? And, and what, what circumstances, what would be happening for that? Do you have to go ahead like that? Well, that's definitely not my baseline, as I just indicated. I don't think we'll need to get real interest rates that high. But, of course, things could happen differently uh, than, than we expect and would have to, especially around inflation, but also how, str how strong is the economy, even with higher interest rates? Does the, do we still have these imbalances between supply and demand? Right now, I mean, PC inflation is 6% over the last 12 months, and we have clear signs that demand exceeds supply in our economy and our labor market. So to me, the question of how high we have to get to is really going to depend on what we see in inflation and the supply and demand imbalance. Again, my base case is we don't have to get that high. I think we have some favorable developments uh, underway, things that we've been talking about for a long time. Supply chains definitely are getting better around the world. We're seeing that in a lot of different data. And we're also seeing you know, some of the goods prices and import prices come down, a reversal of some of those pandemic era uh, things that pushed up inflation. So we've got a few factors I think are going to bring inflation down to three to three and a half percent next year. Um, but then the real issue is how do we get it all the way to two? Of course, is, but right there, though, is the message from Wednesday that and this ties in with are you maybe if you would, might have to go higher sure. is the message that if it's not coming down as we expect, then we are clearly open to going higher, taking the next step. Well, we're going to have to do what's necessary, again, sufficiently restrictive, to bring inflation down to 2%. And it could be higher than what we've written down. And we have had to increase our interest rate projections. As the data have come in, inflation has been stubbornly high, as you know, many people have said. And we've seen the economy remain very resilient to higher interest rates. Remember, the unemployment rate is 3.7%. Some signs of sl a slowing demand for labor, but still a very, very strong uh, imbalance between supply and demand right now. 
You know, uh, there were two surprisingly good CPI reports going into this meeting, and so a lot of people thought, well, that, that good news for the Fed. You know, maybe they're not going to be uh, quite as aggressive. Um, but at the same time, what happened, 2023 inflation forecast, boom, goes up. Mm -hmm. what, how did this happen? What's guiding your view on inflation? Again, uh, two good surprises on CPI, and yet the, the PC core, core and PC overall still can expected to rise. Right. And again, relative to, say, our earlier projections in September, the, you know, I think that you really have to think about what's happening in the inflation data. So we are seeing good news. I like good news on inflation reports. A lot of that's in the goods areas and some of the areas we've been long expecting those inflation rates to come down. So that wasn't so, you know, uh, that's something that we've been expecting to see is part of the baseline forecast. Where inflation is still high is in these core services areas, mm -hmm. the areas that, you know, are probably going to be more persistent and really reflect the imbalance between supply and demand in the labor market and in our overall economy. So, sure, we are seeing some good signs on goods and some other categories. I'm also seeing some good signs in the, in the rents for new leases of apartments and houses. So, you know, that inflation should eventually start coming down later in, in the latter part of next year. But, again, in these other core services, that inflation rate is still high. And that really gets to how strong the labor market is. So, sure, some good news, but the underlying issue of core core services inflation is still very much there. Well, you know, your your, your forecast for unemployment next year is a, a big jump, mm -hmm. right? You see it much much uh, weaker, up to uh, almost full percentage point from what you're looking at in September, four point six percent. You're looking for GDP uh, to be much weaker than you thought three months right. ago, down to zero point five percent. So. Is this the kind of forecast that is consistent with uh, a soft landing? Is it consistent with something maybe not quite that good? Well, I think it is a, it's a, an economy that's continuing to grow. As you pointed out, the median dot uh, is around half a percent growth for this year and for next year. So as an economy that's growing, uh, it's an economy where the unemployment rate is, 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 is rising somewhat. As you mentioned, the, the median would be at 4.6 percent at the end of next year. I, so I don't see this as a recession. We're clearly not in a recession right now based on the data. It is an economy that is growing mo only modestly, and I think it's an economy that's really seen uh, the imbalance issues between supply and demand. Demand diminishing and inflation coming down. Is the retail sales were were weak across the board pretty much? Uh, is this a canary in the coal mine for the, where the economy is heading and a part of the economy you want to get final demand down? Right. Is this maybe an early sign that you're succeeding? But well, we have to look at all of the data on that. And obviously, where we're seeing the signs of the economy slowing is in the housing sector and now in manufacturing. Consumer spending has been kind of jumping around a bit month and month to month, quarter to quarter. It's actually been more up until this latest data, more resilient perhaps than I was expecting. So we just have to you know, go through all that data and really see kind of the underlying strength in the economy. That data doesn't change my basic view that we're going to have an economy growing modestly over the next year. You know, you're talking about the uh, the... Uh, services X housing, right? Okay. Core services X housing is, is the, your, seems like it's the key indicator now. We have to see that uh, coming down for the Fed to be convinced that inflation's moving in the right direction. Well, I think that is a, it is most closely related in many ways to the state of the labor market and you know, domestic price pressures. Some of these other categories, which of course are part of the inflation index, we don't ignore any of them, but they really are about the special factors, right. car prices that skyrocketed, sure. uh, tra transportation costs and things like that. And then the, I think the housing market, we're already seeing some good indicators eventually right. of that coming down. So this is the area that we're, that's not coming down, and we definitely need to see it coming down to get to that 2% inflation goal. So... A lot of focus on labor and wages in that part of it, right? That's, that's what's important. That's what uh, Chair Powell pointed out this week. So uh, do you think that there are signs of a wage price spiral right now? Is that one of your concerns? Again, and when you look at CP, CPI is coming down, that's good news. But boy, oh boy, the, the trend is still too much up. Us. Yeah. So I don't see any signs of a wage price spiral of the kind that we saw in the 70s. A couple uh, data points I'd point to. One is uh, inflation expectations have been coming down. Uh, they've been really well anchored for longer run expectations. But we've also seen in our New York Fed survey and in the Michigan survey, shorter term inflation expectations coming down. So I think that we're not seeing that kind of dynamic kick in of, of people expecting higher inflation, demanding higher wage increases because of that. The other is, you know, I really see wages is kind of the barometer, one of the of the strength of the, the labor market about demand and supply. Right. I think wage growth has been very high because labor demand has been really strong relative to available, 
available supply. As labor demand and supply get better in, in better balance, I think you know the wage gains will be more in, inconsistent with will be more consi consistent with longer term trends and our two percent. What do you make of the uh, the Southwest Airlines uh, contract that was just signed? They're going to get a twenty four percent increase in wages over the next uh, what is it five years four years excuse me. Uh, is that a, a concern? Well, you know, we're seeing a lot of adjustment in wages for around the country. I'm not going to point to any specific one. I mean, again, wage increases right now, given where inflation has been, given where the labor market is, are, are still quite high. Um, and so we're watching those indicators. Okay. To me, it's really about tracking how the economy okay. does over the next year, labor demand, supply, and wages. I want to focus on financial conditions. Uh, yeah. Chair Powell noting that the markets and the Fed are, seem to be working at cross purposes a lot of the time lately. Are you concerned about this push-pull between the Fed and where it's trying to lead and uh, where the markets want to go? Well, I, you know, I think we need to be, and we are being clear on what we're trying to, what we're going to achieve uh, and how we're going to achieve it. I think that, you know, the economic projections and the dot plot we put out provide a, a, a nice roadmap of how we're seeing the economy and monetary policy over the next couple of years. Uh, and obviously, financial conditions depend on a lot of other things than, than just monetary policy. So I always look at a broad set of monetary policy, uh, sorry, financial conditions, understand how that feeds into our, our outlook. Right now, I know that, you know, a lot of some market participants clearly or more optimistic about inflation coming down. I look at the real interest rates implied by that. I think pretty much everyone understands that real interest rates need to get restricted and stay there for Is a while. Is that an issue for the Fed, though, when you're trying to, um, you're trying to move policy in a certain direction? Right. Uh, you want to tighten. And if the markets rally and then condi financial conditions soften for whatever interpretation mm -hmm. markets are taking, is that an issue? Does that make the job harder? It doesn't make the job hard harder, but it's just another one of those factors like the, you know, what's happening in the global economy. A lot of things that have to feed into our view of where the economy is going. And, and then what we need to do. Clearly, to the extent that you know, financial conditions have tightened quite a bit over the past year, consistent with our moving to, towards a restrictive or to a restrictive stance of policy, that's an important part of the transmission of monetary policy of the economy. In keeping with that, I want to ask you one last question, uh, because there's this, we're hearing this a lot, that the, the Fed let inflation get out of control for whatever reason, and that this may have eroded the credibility of the Fed with the markets. So how do you respond to that? Well, we're absolutely committed uh, to getting inflation back to our 2% goal, uh, and we're acting in that way. I think we're communicating in that way. So I don't think we've lost the credibility, of course, at all. Uh, I do think that, you know, we are completely united in our focus on getting inflation back to 2%. We've taken extraordinarily strong uh, uh, policy uh, actions over the past year, and as we've shown, we're going to continue to take the actions that are needed to get inflation back to 2%. Price stability is absolutely essential for a strong economy in the long run. We we need to get that done, and we will. All right. Well, 2023, here it comes. <laughs> President John Williams, thank you so much for joining us today. Well, thank you. Okay, Lisa, back to you. Great work. Kathleen Hayes uh, with John Williams of the New York Federal Reserve. Thank you. Not seeing signs of a 1970s type of wage price spiral, talking about modest growth coming down, but not necessarily a recession. I want to just give you more details. Bloomberg now confirming the reports earlier from Semaphore about Goldman Sachs potentially cutting as many as 4,000 jobs. Uh, according to the story, top managers have been asked to identify potential cost reduction targets. No final job cut number has been identified, but they are all continuing to deliberate on this after a period of tremendous growth. Just to give you some perspective, uh, the workforce had grown by 34 percent since the end of 2018, surpassing 49,000 in this year's third quarter. Coming up, we'll have more of a sense of the potential ramifications from that. The S&P future is down about 1 percent ahead of the open. This is Bloomberg. What you see in these periods of higher inflation when central banks ease more slowly into the recession is they last longer and the drawdowns in assets are longer. So we'd expect kind of double the normal length of a recession because the Fed's not going to be at your back for a long time. And that's a big deal. 
That was Greg Jensen, Bridgewater Associates co-chief investment officer, after talking about how a reopening of China is not necessarily a tailwind for risk assets. It could potentially be a headwind, particularly for the U.S. and Europe, if you do get a situation where it boosts inflation at a time when Europe is heading into some sort of downturn. Right now in markets, we are seeing futures lower ahead of the open, adding to the losses of yesterday. S&P futures lower by about 1 percent, and Goldman Sachs adding to that with also a 1 percent decline after reports of potentially 4,000 job cuts. Euro has actually gained a touch versus the dollar, basically flat, 106.29. Ten-year yields up just a bit, not anywhere close to the yield move that we've seen in European markets after what we heard from Christine Lagarde. And oil a little bit lower as people get concerned perhaps about the prospect of recessionary conditions, 2.5% decline on the NYMEX, $74.21. We've been talking all morning about Goldman Sachs and the potential layoffs within uh, their ranks as they start to reshape ahead of what's to come. Their shares are down almost 2 percent in pre-market trading. There's also a question about how the banking industry is reshaping ahead of the potential downturn, where people are living, where they are moving to. And Pridium was sort of interesting to me because it was a hedge fund firm that was founded by a Goldman Sachs partner that actually just opened a Florida office. Josh Pristaw is joining us now. He's co-head of real estate at Pridium, which is not what he wanted to talk about. You wanted to talk about a whole host of other things having to do with the real estate market, as do I. But I want to start here because of the Goldman Sachs news. Do you see a wholesale shift in where people are looking to live, where people are looking to spend money, and allocating your capital accordingly? Thanks, Lisa. Pleasure to be here. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm Josh Prista, head of real estate for Predium. Predium is a $50 billion alternative asset management firm. We manage real estate investments in approximately 100,000 single family rental homes across 33 markets in the U.S., valued at around $33 billion. So, uh, great question. Uh, our investments over the last 10 years have really followed uh, a general theme of cheaper and warmer. Uh, so, the migration trends are from generally the coastal cities to places in the southeast and southwest. So I think we'll continue to invest in, in those uh, locations. Uh, but, but to your point about opening an office in Miami, <clears throat> you know, our job is to find great investments for our investors, but also attract the, the best human capital. So uh, we will, as we uh, become more flexible and look to find the best talent, uh, that could be anywhere. So. We are talking about the potential for layoffs, the potential for some sort of downturn, and people are very concerned about the housing market more broadly uh, due to how high mortgage rates have gone. How is the pace of the capital that you've deployed in buying up some of these single-family homes changed this year versus the same time last year? Sure. It's definitely uh, slower as interest rates have gone up. But the interesting thing about uh, what the Fed's doing with increasing interest rates uh, as part of a, a strategy of I would say deliberate demand destruction in the single family for sale market to tame inflation is that is uh, interestingly stimulating demand for rent because as you pointed out, it's more difficult for people to buy. So our view is over the long term, uh, rents are going to grow faster than home prices uh, in part because of that. Well, but we've seen recent anecdotal data showing potentially even downturns in rents and, and the valuations there, particularly in some of the cheaper and warmer places sure. that you're talking about. Do you think that those anecdotes are inaccurate and don't really jive with what you're seeing on the ground? So uh, I think people uh, uh, during COVID, uh, data, I think, was distorted or, or smoothed out. So historically, pre-COVID, uh, pre this surge in demand for all kinds of goods and, and rental housing or, or even ho homes for purchase, there was always an element of seasonality. So rents and home prices usually go down in the back half of the year. Our data shows over 10 years almost all of the rent growth is in the first half of the year. And that's because most people either buy a home or rent a home in advance of the school year. Now, that being said, we are seeing a deceleration compared to the very torrid uh, rent growth and home price appreciation earlier in the year. But I do want to point out, because you referenced job losses, uh, is that uh, job losses and the fear of recession, which is in the, the media and the news every day, uh, is probably having a dampening effect on household formation. But when we look at the long-term fundamentals, because we're not trading these homes, we're investing in them long-term, those fundamentals look really great. As the millennials move into the peak household formation period, they overwhelmingly want a single-family home. As you raise capital, and you think about when to deploy it, you say that you still are deploying, although perhaps not at the same pace that you were last year. I do wonder if you're expecting some sort of dislocation that will offer a better price entry point. Sure. Uh, so 
Actually, I think it's a, a really incredible time because for single family homes, it's perhaps the only institutional real estate asset class that has been repriced to today's reality of demand and interest rates. And that's because there's a difference between long-term owners and short-term owners. We're relatively constructive on home prices. We think they will continue to fall a little bit next year, maybe four or 5%. But the housing market's very stable because essentially 83 million Americans have a mortgage that is at a three and a quarter percent interest rate. So most Americans can't afford to sell their house and buy a smaller home uh, if they're going to swap a 3% mortgage for a 7%, let alone a, a, a bigger, more expensive uh, house. Another way of asking this is some of the other uh, big single-family homeowners, I'm thinking of Blackstone, I'm thinking of a whole bunch of others that have gotten into this area. Are they selling? Are they pairing back? Are they starting to look around for potential interested buyers? Sure. We buy homes three ways. We've historically bought them one at a time off the multiple listing service. We bought 58,000 that way in, in the last 10 years. We buy homes from other portfolio operators, own owners, and then we buy homes from home builders. We see perhaps the best opportunity today is to buy homes from home builders because with mortgages at 7%, they're having a hard time selling that inventory. So it's a fantastic opportunity to partner with home builders to basically bring new high quality homes to American households and so help solve the affordability problem that they're seeing. What regions are you looking at in particular? So we're generally in the Southeast and Southwest. As I mentioned, it's you know sort of cheaper and warmer. So think Phoenix, Las Vegas, Orlando, Tampa, Nashville. Although it's gotten less cheap, right, and especially as more people have gone in. And there is a political question, especially as uh, the Fed is trying to jawbone down inflation mm -hmm. and they talk about, you know, the rents are, are too damn high and all that. So uh, how much are you concerned? Uh, how do you weigh that kind of calculus when figuring out how much you can raise rents and, and what's an appropriate level? Sure. Well, we have uh, uh, tended to put um, be, be very mindful of that and 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 sort of self-impose uh, rental caps at time. We're very focused on affordability, and our view is uh, we believe in housing choice, and so we think that residents or homeowner residents should be able to choose the neighborhood they want and make the determination: do they want to buy or do they want to rent? And part of what we're focused on, we just announced a partnership with a company called Isuzu, uh, which essentially builds positive rent positive credit scores for people who pay the rent. I wasn't aware that 40 million Americans are essentially credit invisible. And so we are essentially helping them while they are residents with us when they pay their rent to build their credit score. So to the extent they want to buy a home, we're helping them on that path. Is it getting, is it taking longer to sign up people for leases at this point? Are people pushing back? Are you feeling sort of the pain that some people talk about when it comes to inflation, how much it's crimping people's buying power? Uh, to a certain extent, again, I, some of this is seasonal. So what we people forget that this time of year, it usually takes a little longer and, and rents go down a little. But when we look at uh, sort of the top of funnel demand, so uh, data and technology really powers what we do. We have essentially a 2,500 person real estate operation that is committed to servicing residents and giving them a great institutional experience. The top of funnel, which is what comes in, people that are interested in looking at our homes at the prices that we're offering them, is, is up over last year. So we don't see a decrease in demand. Just looking out, you said that you see a 4 to 5% decline in home prices, maybe. Are there certain regions that you see a much bigger price decline than that? Uh, I mean, what you've tended to see more in uh, the more tech-focused uh, sort of coastal regions like San Francisco, West Coast, uh, we're not investing there. So uh, we're, we're, the, that, that's the national number. Where we're investing, we expect that number to maybe be even lower. Really? Even though there's been such price appreciation going forward? There's a lot of demand. You, you, look, at the, you look at the where the, uh, the, the migratory trends are. And I, I, you know, it's cheaper and warmer, but we also like to follow the U-Hauls. So that's where people are moving. Companies are moving there. People are moving there. There's demand. Follow the U-Hauls. I love that. Josh Pristow, co-head of real estate at Predium. Thank you so much for being Thanks with us. Thanks for having me. Really interesting, especially as people talk about whether we start to see some disinflation from uh, rents. A lot of people point to the fact that rents typically do not go down over time. Josh Pristow sort of accentuating that. Right now, ahead of the open, we are about a half an hour, 35 minutes away, and we do see uh, those losses maintained, perhaps people resetting after really reading through what Fed Chair Jay Powell said, down 1%. This is Bloomberg.